Welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC on ABC6, Whitaker versus Alaskarov, also known as UFC Saudi Arabia. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com. With me, as usual, taking time out of his father's day to record with me is Keith Schilland, the executive producer of the SureDog Radio Network. Keith, happy Father's Day to you, and how are you doing? Thank you, man. Thank you brother. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, happy Father's Day to all our listeners, and... Uh, yeah, man. Happy goodness. Father's Day to uh, Nico Price, to uh, <laughs> Alex Oliveira. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm sure Zhangla Jumagulov, between the two wives, has plenty of kids. Uh, yeah, yeah, so especially uh, to, to, all the to, to Moicano's dad, who's, who's making <laughs> babies. <laughs> I forgot about the Moicano's dad thing. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's going to be a wild one, folks. Anyway, uh, you know, obviously you were out uh, last night. Adam stepped in and we recapped, you know, UFC Vegas 93. The less said about that, the better. I mean, that card's going to be forgotten quickly. But here the UFC is back in the Middle East. They're in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. These are traditionally especially in the last five years, cards that the UFC has stacked with fighters that might otherwise have trouble getting visas to the U.S. There are tons of fighters from the Middle East. The CIS is where your Dagestanis, your Tajiks, you know, uh, your your Chechens show up. Uh, it certainly got that. The biggest news, of course, is that the UFC's most famous and dominant Chechen, uh, Mr. Hamzat Shemaev, was supposed to headline this card, withdrew with an injury uh, about 10 days out from fight night. In steps Ikram Alaskarov, who had been scheduled to be the co-main event last night in Vegas, he gets a big step up both in competition because he had been in a complete squash match against Antonio Trocoli. Now he's stepping up to fight former multiple-time champ Robert Whitaker uh, in the main event of a much higher-profile card. Tell me how you feel about the card in general, and without tipping your hand as to the matchup, how do you feel about the kind of late shuffle in the, in the main event. So when you, when you rank cards, obviously, you know, you kind of have to put them in that categories like pay-per-views obviously going to be better than ABC cards. ABC cards are better than your, you know, apex fight nights or, uh, and actually almost, you almost have to put it in four categories now with, you know, the, the fight nights that are on the road versus the fight nights that are in apex. But, so the ABC cards are usually much better. You put you add in in Saudi Arabia, and, and obviously that's like such an era right now for entertainment. You know, especially combat sports. I'm this was this I had this as an A. Like I thought it was absolutely loaded. Al Scarif is as good of a replacement as you possibly could find on that short of a notice. They also lost Bashrat versus Montel Jackson that like fell out this week, and that was another really you know important fight. I thought it was a really good matchup. So they lost two. So I'm gonna probably go like a B plus on this card. And I know a lot of people be like, dude, what are you talking about? Like Alice Care is such a such a great test for Shamaya. You're missing the promotional side of it. Like Shamaya was gonna say some things that got to get me excited this week. That now Alice, I mean. I, Maybe Al Scarif will say stuff and he'll he'll talk himself up. And I know he's already kind of gone on Twitter and kind of got himself this fight because of that. I just like Shemayev to me. Uh, he has such star quality. I know this like these supposed he has some real health scare and you know the rumor mill is not good. But the I just man, I was so pumped for that fight. Like it, it on paper, it might be my favorite fight booked right now. Like what fights that are booked. It could have ended up being my most anticipated fight of the year that wasn't a title fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm just talking about like fights that are absolutely booked right now that I would be excited for. Yeah. Yeah, that, it was, that it was right, at least unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, I, and like I said, I like Alice Gareth a lot. Like I think he's really good. I think he's a tough test for, for Whitaker. So I think they did really good in a replacement. But it's just a mark. Like, like Pavlovich Vol Volkov is a fantastic heavyweight fight. But they're not going to say anything. The press play. conference, you remember Rocky IV, it'd be like the press conferences, only instead of Creed and Drago, it's just two Dragos just sitting there. And not yeah, saying exactly, anything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you keep going down, like, no one's going to say anything on this card. Like, no one's going to give you any. And I know right now there's somebody being like, dude, we don't need them. Marcel Dosso, man. But I need it. <laughs> like, I, I enjoy it. So yeah. 
and, and then again, like we lost another great fight. So I'll give like a B plus. Like I'm still very excited for this card. Uh, agreed. I, I, I think a B plus is very appropriate. It's, it, it's a pretty loaded card. It's that rare card that could survive those kind of losses and still be something I'm pretty much looking forward to from top to bottom. Yeah, um, we, have three, we have three or four fights that could headline a fight night on this card. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously Whitaker and Alex Karoff, Pavlovich and Volkov. Like those oh, two Pavlovich are- and Volkov would have been, it, like if they just had that headline, a fight night, it would have been in the top probably yeah. 25% of fight night headliners for the year. Absolutely. And it's the co-main event, yeah. You know, Walker, Usumia could, you know, not, not the sexiest one, but that could headline a, a fight night. Gaslam Rodriguez, again, not the sexiest one, but that could headline a fight night. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, think it's, so I think it's a great card, yeah. It's It's got good stuff. It has, uh, obviously, the UFC, ever since Connor first broke, has been looking for the next Connor. And then ever since Shemaev kind of burst out of nowhere, they're kind of looking for the next Shemaev. They've got some next Shemaev candidates in this card. I mean, Shara Bullet is in what I believe now. Yeah, Sh- Shara Bullet is currently scheduled to be in the top prelim. He is somebody that he's got to look. He's got a certain cockiness and personality to him. Yeah. He's got the undefeated record. Uh, they're going to ride that until the wheels fall off. And I mean, who knows? Maybe the wheels fall off uh, on Saturday night in uh, in Riyadh. But uh, we'll find out when we get there. Any other general thoughts about this one before we jump into the prelims? No, there's still like even the prelims. Like to me, the the prelims are the much better prelims than than most prelims. So yeah, I, I think it's a pretty good card all the way top to bottom. I'm excited. Well, uh, hot off that intro where Keith and I are talking about how deep this card is, uh, we are leading off with the Road to UFC Singapore Bantamweight Final in the form of Long Zhao versus uh, Chang Ho Lee. Xiao, the 26-year-old from China, is 26-7 and seven overall. This will be his official UFC debut. He appeared on Season 5 of Dana White's Contender Series, where he lost to Christian Quinones, went and won a couple more fights in China, and got picked up by Road to UFC, where he won two fights in a row last year to make his way to the final. Uh, he fought in August, getting a majority decision over uh, Shuya Kamikubo to stamp his ticket to this final, where he will meet Lee. The 30-year-old South Korean is 9-1 and one overall. Uh, this obviously will be his debut as well. He fought on the same card in August that Xiao did, knocking out uh, Jawapasi Darmisi in the third round of a wrestling-heavy extravaganza to, to punch his ticket to this final. Uh, odds here, a dead pick em, one of a couple of them on this card. Both men are out there around minus 110 or minus 115. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't follow Road to UFC. So when I found out this final was on the card, I watched these guys. I, well, I watched all these guys Road to UFC fights. It's a shame because Rong Zhu, who spent three or four fights in the UFC, was on this season. I, I wish he would have made the final because I already have notes on him. But I had to watch both these guys. And after watching both of them, I'm not even dead sure that the two best fighters in the pool made it to the final, if we're being honest. <laughs> I agree. That's actually like, very funny. Yeah. Like, I told, I don't. I wasn't high on any of them. Like, well, I guess, yeah. and wrong, she was a lightweight, but I wasn't high on any of the bantam weights based on what I saw. But uh, Long Zhao, he, like, he won his semifinal and he won it as like nearly a two to one dog, which does speak well of him. But he almost made it harder on himself than he, he needed to. Like, he was the taller guy. He was the Sanda practitioner. He was the guy who wanted to strike. He was taking on a stocky, muscle bound, little Japanese wrestler and like it was a story of three different rounds like round one he got out wrestled badly just uh dude was all over him uh you know took him down took his back uh just generally stuck to him Uh, for the moments that he wasn't being taken down he was stuck to the fence you know just uh just trying to fight to shuck Kamikubo off of him so that's round one round two he starts to achieve some separation But every time he does, instead of starting to tee off, he starts initiating the clinch himself. I I just feel as though he made this fight much harder on himself than he needed to. And like just the the bad fight IQ, the bad tactics there made the fight closer than it needed to be. Then the third round, he really did separate. Uh, Kamikubo was getting tired. Xiao starts teeing off on him. 
what made this a majority decision was that it looks like at least two of the judges must have give, given him a 10-8 round for that. But I didn't think he deserved a 10-8 round. And because of that, I actually don't think he deserved to win the fight. I think he lost 20, uh, 28-29. Uh, and it's a fight he should have won. Like, if you're Grant that he was going to get out wrestled in the first round, just Kami Kubo is a good, you know, he looks like a good wrestler. He was the stronger guy, but then he kind of tuckered himself out. Shao should have taken the second and third rounds off him in pretty straightforward fashion, and he didn't. Uh, considering that in Lee, he's fighting another guy that's going to want to wrestle, that makes me think that even if the physical attributes and the the skills like the raw tools favor him i don't trust him to win this fight unless he really learned some lessons there uh with lee i have the same problems where he came out with a win in his semifinal, but it didn't leave me feeling better about him like lee and jalapassi both wanted to wrestle and jalapassi was just better he was a bigger guy he was a better wrestler and for the first round and a half of the fight he was all over him like slammed him got at least one rear naked choke attempt for the few times that they were on the feet, he landed the bigger strikes. Uh, Lee was well on his way to losing pretty straightforward 30, 27 decision when he uh, took Chow Posse's back in the third round with a completely blatant, like toes through the fence that he used to like turn a back tech that he wouldn't have been able to finish into like a finished one. And then just ground and pounded him to death. Like, I, I, cool that he got away with it. You know, if, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. But again, that same uh, s- sequence away from the fence where he couldn't have done that, or if uh, Kevin Sataki had been on the ball and it pulled his toes out of the fence, he loses that fight. So I'm not even confident we got the two best bantamweights out of that pool. And I'm not high on either guy to make many waves in, you know, arguably the UFC's toughest division, but one of these guys is going to get at least a couple of tries and coin flip. I think it's going to be Lee just again, Zhao is going to be bigger. He's going to be much taller. He's probably going to be the better striker, probably going to have more power, but I just, I don't trust him not to get wrestled and not to give Lee opportunities to wrestle him. So give me Lee to win two rounds out of three here uh, and punch his ticket to at least a couple more fights in the UFC, but it's not with a whole lot of confidence. Yeah. Um, man, these guys, the, <clears throat> we bragged about how great this <laughs> card is. This starts off with, uh, these two guys. I, well, I, can I, I say one thing? Co- at yeah. least they spread it out. Cause that one card, the, uh, yeah, Lewis versus Spivak one where they put all the road to UFC finals on it. And so the entire, undercard was just kind of mediocre Asian fighters that none of the UFC's yeah. American fans had ever heard of was a <laughs> terrible idea. Yeah. yeah that's anyway, true. That's true. that is true. <laughs> like take your vegetables a little bit at a time. <laughs> uh, I didn't get to do too much tape study on either one of these guys. Uh, but what, one thing I will say, and, and obviously the line is so close for some reason, like an hour before the event starts, if suddenly one of these guys just get, tons of money because i coming in on them <laughs> go run to your, your bookie and bet on that guy for some reason <laughs> just that's all i'm just saying um how do i see it what a guy's long shao how, how do i say yeah name? long shao yeah long shao i like that he's only 26 years old he, he's he's not a great athlete though like he, he's a you know, he's striking. He's a boxer with a high guard defense he, he, he does well to press the action forward with pretty good output he does best when he gets to the pocket. And the problem is he's kind of slow. Uh, he, he does hit hard. I'll give him that. And he sits on his punch as well. And he and he throws a lot of power shots. I, I like that his calf kicks, like he'll end his combination with some calf kicks. But he's open to, to leg kicks himself because he's heavy on his front foot. He, he likes to try to get the fight to the ground. But you mentioned he's not a strong wrestler. Like he gets in wrestling positions a lot. But he, what I've seen, he's not a strong wrestler. He's a good grappler. He's got nine subs on his record. And, and if he's taken down, you know, he's a pretty strong guy. He's, he's, got, you know, he's pretty good at getting back up. Uh, Chang Ho Lee, like I haven't I've seen even less film on this guy. And what I've seen, I, I'm not very confident to say I have a proper read of him. Yeah, you know, he's a southpaw. He presses the actions well. Uh, trying to force his opponent on his back foot. 
But like you said, his striking is mostly to close the distance. He wants to grind in the clinch. He wants to wrestle. He likes upper body takedowns. The problem is, similar to what I just said about his opponent, he's not that good at it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and his takedown defense is is poor. Uh, if you take him down, he struggles to get back up. He gives up his back to to get up. He loses positions to, to you know, rush to get a submission. Uh, I will say he's got a good ground and pound. I mean, he finished the last opponent with, with ground and pound. But it was a fight that I had him losing. Yeah. I'm – I'm not very confident. Like I said, I haven't seen that much of film. That said, I'm I'm leaning the opposite. I'm going to go with Long Shao. Mm-hmm. He, I think he has advantage in the striking. If if this stays on the outside, uh, he's got pretty good output. He hits hard. Both like the grapple, but I don't see really see either one really as a threat. Or I shouldn't say a threat, but more of having a big advantage. Where like I'm like, oh, if this turns a grapple, this guy should definitely win. So I'll say Long Shao with no confidence on taking by decision. Next up at UFC Saudi Arabia is a middleweight matchup between Cedric West Dumas and Dennis Tululan. Dumas, the 28-year-old Floridian, is 9-2 and two overall. He is 2-2 uh, two and two since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. He's coming into this off of a loss. He fought back in March at UFC on ESPN, Blanchfield versus Fjord, where he got knocked out in the first round by Nursultan Ruzaboyev. Uh, he's stepping in here on short notice. Uh, for the injured Abu Azatar to face Tululan. 36-year-old Russian is 10-9 and nine with one no contest overall. He is 1-4 and four in the UFC, and he is on a three-fight losing streak uh, dating back a little over a year. Uh, he last fought in November, getting knocked out in the second round by Christian Leroy Duncan. That was at UFC Fight Night Allen versus Craig. Uh, so he's looking to s- snap that losing streak. Again, he had been scheduled to fight Abu Azatar. Azatar is out. Dumas is in. That narrows up the line a little bit, but uh, Tululan is still the underdog. Dumas is around minus 145. Tululan plus 120. Uh, all right, so Dennis Tululan is 1-4 and four in the UFC, and his only win in all that time is almost two years ago over Jamie Pickett, who... Uh, also, it was like <laughs> left the UFC like one and four, yeah, one and five. Just, I, I mean, yeah. So Tululan and Pickett are two of the lower level guys to get more than two fights in the UFC at middleweight in the last couple of years. I I can see what Tululan wants to do. If you look at his regional tape, uh, he's a pretty solid kickboxer who fights longer and taller than the tail of the tape says. But he just hasn't had the speed or the defensive soundness or the durability to make it work at the UFC level. He's, I mean, he's gotten, uh, you would have, you would expect him to get taken down and hustled on the floor by better ground fighters. But the bigger problem is that he's also gotten busted up by uh, people who aren't even really kickboxers first and foremost. That's more of a problem. Just if kickboxing is a specialty and even that isn't at a, really at a UFC level, he doesn't have much place in the promotion. Abu Azatar was going to run this dude over. Cedric was Dumas is a slightly better matchup for him, just in that Dumas is one of the few guys in the division with an even less proven ground game than his own. But honestly, I favor Dumas in a kickboxing match. Dumas is taller, longer, younger, probably hits harder. Dumas has his problems as well. Not talking about his legal problems. We know what what, what his deal is there, but for a guy that has impressive offense, like good, fast, hard kicks to all levels, you know, some accurate punches. He has defensive lapses as well. About the only good thing I can say about this fight is that it's probably going to be a lot of fun and it's probably going to be a finish within the first round and a half. And neither guy is probably going to try to take it to the ground, but yeah, just give me Dumas as the better of two flawed kickboxers here. Uh, give me Dumas by a knockout late in the first round. And I think uh, Tululan's uh, probably not long for the UFC. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dumas took the fight. And I, and I agree with you. It might have got an even harder fight for for Tululan. Uh, people know, if you're a frequent listener, you, they know how I feel about Dumas. I think the guy's a terrible human being. I, I, I've yeah. said this before. He's... This isn't like innocence proving guilty. This guy's been convicted for hitting women and admitted to hitting women. And 
And and that's just all stuff that's been reported. So as far as his skills, he does have skills. I mean, the guy's a very big guy. He's a kickboxer. He's long and lengthy. He's explosive. He closes the distance quickly with big and long shots. Doesn't have the best output, but he has serious power. I, I mean, he's got a good kicking game. He kicks hard to the body. He's got some good calf kicks. His issues has been defensively back straight up. I mean, he was cracked by Josh Frem in their fight. He wrestles a lot. You know, for a guy you think of a kickboxer. I was like, did you see the news story where he admitted that he was like totally high for the Josh yeah, Frem fight? Like, what a fuck like, it, well, if, if, if not for the other stuff, if he was just a regular dude who had been high for his UFC debut, it'd be a funny story. But because yeah. he's a piece of crap, otherwise, it just it's yeah. one more log on the fire. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fuck this guy. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm 100% with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I know right away there's going to be some asshole in the comments saying, dude, Keith, you got to let it go, man. You know, the guy can't make a mistake. No, beating up women is not a mistake. So, yeah. anyways, you know, a mistake is like I forgot to put up the trash on Thursday night. That's a mistake. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. punching my wife. I, nah, yeah. I, I, put, I put my girlfriend in the trash on Thursday night. That's <laughs> not a mistake. That's a poor choice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like I said, the guy wrestles a lot. He He's a – like offensively, he'll get some takedowns. He he's a weak defensive wrestler, though his takedown defense against Cody Brundage was better than than when he first came to the UFC. Uh, but he was still even taken down in that fight. He 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 is a submission threat, but he will rush submissions. Uh, he did get a guillotine on the contender series. He's gassed out bad in the past, and taking this fight on short notice is is obviously a concern. But his cardio was better against Cody Brundage. Tululin, the one thing Tululin has from him, he's a big guy. He's, like, he's a big middleweight. He's also long and lengthy. I'd say he's a pressure striker, good output. His, his hands are faster than you'd expect with someone as, as bad a record as he has. He likes to work behind a jab. He likes to slide into the pocket, unload hard shots. Even though he's a, a lengthy guy, he likes to like brawl it out in the pocket, though he can get these really wild haymakers, that, you know, making them really easy to counter. He hits hard, though. I'll give him that. I like that he works the body, some hard kicks to the body. I like his step in knees. He, he's also like an underrated wrestler himself. He'll, he'll get a takedown. He looks to advance position on, on the ground. He's not a submission threat at all. Uh, and he's he's been subbed in the past. I mean, Jung Young Park subbed him recently. So I'm not picking a human as bad as Dumas. I just, I, just my own morals. Like, I, because at the end of the day, I root for my pit. You know, I, I root that I'm right. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, I've told people how I how I root for for my my picks. That's how it kind of goes. If you ever heard it funny, and if you heard, so be it. I start the night off rooting for my picks, and once I get one wrong, then I just root for what's the the funnest thing to talk about for the rest of the card. So, uh, I say Dumas wins the opening round but gasses him out because of his short notice fight and Tululin beats him with volume the last two rounds and Tululin wins a split decision. We head now to the light heavyweight division for the debut of Magomed Gajiazulov against Brenton Hibero. Gajiazulov, the 30-year-old Dagestani, is a perfect 8-0 as a professional. This will be his uh, UFC debut. He fought on the Contender Series last October, taking a unanimous decision over Jose Medina. He will look for his first official octagon win against Hibero, who is looking for the same thing. Uh, Hibero, 27-year-old Brazilian, is 15-6 and six with one no contest overall. He fought on the Contender Series as well. In fact, just a couple weeks before Gaji Azulov ba uh, back last September, uh, he's already made his UFC debut. He fought at UFC 298 back in February, where he got knocked out by Zhang Mingyang after about a minute and a half of wild brawling. So uh, he did not get the best of that. He's coming back here with a second chance at a first win in the UFC. He is decidedly not favored to get it. Uh, Gaji Azulov is minus 350. Hibero plus 250 on the comeback. Uh, there's some things to like about Magomed Gaji Azulov. Uh, you know, if, if there are two basic types of Dagestani fighter, like the long, lanky kickboxer who can wrestle versus the stocky, burly wrestler who may or may not be able to strike. He's definitely the longer, lankier kickboxer who can wrestle. But at least on the regional scene, like, he, I mean, he basically was knocking everybody out in two minutes. So we got, we didn't get to see much of his ground game. Uh, but in his last fight in uh, Brave CF, you know, he 
showed good takedown defense. He was, uh, yeah, I, there are lots of question marks and you don't love that a guy with only eight pro fights is already 30 years old, but this is light heavyweight. So he's got some time to work. Uh, it's all, I mean, his, his upside in the division is really going to depend on what it looks like when he meets guys who can match his raw physical tools and whether he can actually stave off takedowns from big determined wrestlers at, at 205. Uh, we're probably not going to find out. We may not find out too much about his takedown defense here against, I guess, he like he better can wrestle to a certain extent, but it's not his first choice. I have the feeling he's just going to bite down on the mouth guard and, and brawl with Gaji Azulov, which I mean, that's great for our entertainment value, but I don't think it spells good things for him. Like he better hits hard and he is a big guy that create, you know, is I think used to creating matchup problems just with his raw size and his reach. Uh, but Gaji Azulov is a pretty composed striker. I think he's more defensively sound. I think he busts he better up bad. Uh, give me Gaji Azulov by second round TKO. I think this is a fun fight. This is a, should be a good action fight. Uh, they're both the really big action guys. Hibero, I, I think he's pretty well-rounded. He's got this incredible 81-inch reach. I, I mean, obviously, he can be a good distance striker, but he's very unorthodox. He's wild. He he throws too many single strikes for my liking, but he can land from like a mile away. Uh, he is a bit of a brawler when he should be a point fighter from distance. He mixes punches and kicks together well. He's he's got good power. He's got nine TKOs. Um, he'll toss out, you know, the occasional very quick high kick. He likes teep kicks a lot up the middle. He is heavy on his front foot, so he's open to leg kicks. Keeps his chin high in the air. You have to worry about his chin because he was knocked out in his last fight. Uh, if I did, I, I believe he was a favorite of that one. He he will look for takedowns, but he's not he's not a takedown artist. But if he's on top, he's got those like long arms stuff. He's got like that Johnny Walker me ground and pound. He's got six subs on his record. Gutsy, oh, you got to help me out with this one. <laughs> Gutsy Gut, Gut, is love. Yeah, Gutsy. Uh, Mega Man, how about that? Mega Man. He, <clears throat> he's also like a really big light heavyweight. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you talked about his striking. I, I like his striking a lot too. Fights out of both stances. He's explosive, quick hands, nice jab. I, I like his check left hook. He's constantly throwing combinations. So he's got good output, really good kicking game, hard kicks to the body, quick high kick. He kept throwing like a spinning elbow on the contender series and was landing. I mean, he was teeing off on the poor soul he fought in the contender series. <laughs> that, I, that guy was just so freaking tough, like would not quit. He wouldn't quit on himself, but I was like, oh, my God. It looked like freaking Rocky hitting those – the big uh, – <laughs> like the big size of beef, of land. yeah. <laughs> like, like that. Uh, defensively, he, he keeps his chin a little too high in the air. I like that he'll mix in offensive wrestling. He's got good entries. He's strong. Uh, he's on top. He's got some hard ground pound. Like I said, this fight to me, I think is all action. I, I think uh, Magomed should have a, a a good advantage in the wrestling. Uh, but I, I am with you. I expect it to be a little bit of a slugfest on the feet. I think both guys might have their moments, but I think Magomed is a is the cleaner striker. I think he drops. I just keep watching him, and I just keep picturing a, a kick to the body. He was blasting his other opponent on the contender series of the body, and, and that guy didn't go down because he's so insanely tough. I don't think if a regular human being could could take the shot. So I say he he blasts, uh, you know, kick to the liver, falls up with shots. I'm gonna say Magomed was my first round TKO. Next up on the UFC on ABC six prelims, there are two fighters from Tajikistan in the UFC. They are both on this card. And uh, one of them is up next as Kyung Ho Kong uh, tries to prevent Muin Gafarov from getting his first win in the octagon. Kong, the 36 year old South Korean is 19 and 10 with one, no contest overall. He is eight and four with one, no contest in the UFC. Uh, he is coming in off a loss. He fought at UFC 295 back in November, dropping a unanimous decision to John Castaneda. He will look to bounce back from that at the expense of Gafarov, who, as I mentioned, is still looking for that first win in the octagon. The 28-year-old Tajik, who goes by Tajik, is 18-6 and six overall. He is 
0-2 since joining the UFC as a veteran of season five of Dana White's Contender Series, where he also lost. Uh, he fought most recently back in October at UFC 294, where he got guillotined in the first round by Saeed Nurmagomedov. His UFC debut was uh, almost exactly a year ago, and he dropped a unanimous decision to the same Castaneda who uh, handed Kong his last loss. So Gafarov looking for his first win in the octagon, uh, the little octagon or the big one. He is finally favored to get one. He is minus 140, Kong plus 110 uh, coming back. Uh, Keith, tell me, I, I mean, Kyung Ho Kong, I think he is, I'm, he is a known quantity at this point. He's a 36 year old uh, yeah. Bantamweight who's been in the UFC for a minute. But uh, mm -hmm. tell me if you see any decent upside in Gafarov, despite the two losses to open his UFC run and tell me who you think wins this fight on Saturday. Yeah. So Gaffer was a guy that I, I liked a lot coming to the UFC. I mean, I obviously, you know, 18 and six record, you know, 18 and four when he first came in the UFC. Cassidy is, we've talked about this a lot. Like Cassidy is a tough out for anybody. He, he's a tricky guy. And then, you know, said Namagamana says, say what you're worth that. I, I, I like what I see on Gaffer. He's an action fighter who presses the action. He fights at a nonstop pace, throwing nonstop punches. I think he hits hard. He sits on his punches. He tends to wing his overhand right. He kind of has like this wing and overhand right, like wing and left hook. He kind of throws similar to like a, like a Fado. And again, I'm not comparing to Fado. I'm just saying that style. Uh, throws kicks. Oh, dude, I saw Fado. Yeah, change the subject. I saw Fado in the PFL. And I, that guy is so fucking loaded on steroids. It's insane. He looks better. I, I, I know you've seen him on TV, but in person. Yeah. He looks better now than he ever did when he was in Pride. Well, yeah, he like, always looked a little like, soft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like when you see Fader now, you go, "Oh yeah, better do it on, the, on planet Earth." Like, yeah, I see it. Like this Russian guy who <laughs> is stone cold face and has muscles bulging out of his out of his shirt. But like when he was in Pride, it was like, "What that punch ball?" Like what? Yeah, look, yeah. In Pride, he was like a two hundred and thirty two pound guy yeah. who looked like he could cut to light heavyweight. No, now he looks like he rips phone books for fun. Like he's <laughs> fucking jack. Like you wouldn't believe. It's still kind of like where they go. It's Fado just walking through the room. I, I mean, um, I'm glad he, I'm glad he's living his best sure. life. I think that's hilarious. Yeah, get, get that, get that horse meat. Do it, brother. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're might as well look good if you're in the corner. You know, um, Vader is one of those guys. Like he's. I, uh, I mean, I know he and Dana never got along, but they clearly found the same batch of vitamins. Yeah, I know shit. Maybe he's, <laughs> I saw this thing and it was like, follow Dana White's workout, and then it was like. It was like 10 minutes of Dana White just talking about this crazy technology he has. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, the average person can follow that. They're like, yeah, if you could find this friggin' um, this machine that will replace all your friggin' blood cells with oxygen instantly in a second and then, pu and then pump <laughs> testosterone in it. And, and every time you work out, you should sit in this friggin' chair for 45 minutes. I'm like, you know, then put on this magical blanket. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> And then, but the best thing was like, yeah, follow his workout. I, I thought it was gonna be like, you know, Dana like, you know, doing squats, holding kettlebells or some shit. I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. You know, <laughs> no, like you have to have your own. He has his his like own PI in his, his like office. It's like what? And his oh. personal trainer comes by, like, like fuck off. But uh, anyways, where was I? Uh, yeah, back to yeah, him, him looking like Fedor. Uh, he, he throws a lot of kicks. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're naked kicks, though. He loves spinning attacks because you know the Russians love their spinning attacks. Uh, he he throws he throws it a lot. He, he's he's a good wrestler. He's good at following it to, you know, he follows up his his wrestling into strikes too, which I like. Like he'll shoot in and then kind of throw a combination. Uh, he's a two-time world champion in combat sambo, which does mean a lot to me compared to like when I hear world champion and other things, it's like, you don't care. Combat sambo is one of the ones you're like, oh, yeah. wow. Like how many people in the world right now can say they are a world champion kickboxer? Everybody. Dozens. Does, yeah, but, well, even not even former, but like current, there's probably dozens. How many people oh, yeah. can say they're a world champion in sambo? One in each weight class. Because there is <laughs> yeah, a yeah, global player. sambo federation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I did some I, – I think I watched the kickboxing match once and I was crowned a world champion for it, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Keith Schillen brings world-class kickboxing to the that should be the That should be the new test for uh, Dev and Adam. Let's see which one of them can become a world champion kickboxer <laughs> first. They have to, like – they have to find the quickest route 
out like oh if you can go you know adam can go up to like uh greenland and get, get a championship or something or they, that, that there you go that, that's the assignment that Adam and I talked on the recap last night, and I reminded them that whatever he found in your medicine cabinet was, in fact, planted there by a cop. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah he needs to go, ch- he needs to go check out Fado's yeah. uh, medicine cabinet. <laughs> Holy Christ. Well, we'll get him over there. <laughs> Holy fuck. Fado was walking through. He looked like freaking – he looked like freaking Billy Gunn from the uh, – the uh, what was that team? End of not end of you, D Generation X guys. Okay. <laughs> uh, he's he's got so back to Gaffer. Right? This is the longest breakdown of a fighter ever. We got we got more side stories for Gaffer. Yeah. He's got he's got seven submission wins. Uh, though he was quickly submitted by an Uh I, I'm gonna go back to Fado with his grounded pound. He like he gets on top and he throws these like whipping punches like how Fado used to do it, and, and he's got good cardio. Mm-hmm. To go all 15 minutes. Kang, Kang, like you mentioned, like a lot of my notes could be similar to what we've always said. He's a, he's a big man away. He was a counter striker. Uh, the problem against Cassinet, he had a lack of output in that fight. And I've said this before, he might want to move up a weight class, you know, especially as getting older. On the feet, long jab. He showed some pop against Christian Quinones. That's because he does sit on his punches. Uh, he is a bit of a headhunter, though. He kind of ignores the body. He doesn't check kicks. Though he does throw a, like throws up a high kick a lot himself, he will wrestle a little. He'll he'll shoot for takedowns. When, I shouldn't say a little. He wrestles a lot, but he he will shoot for takedowns when he's being pressured. But like his takedowns aren't great. Uh, if he's on top, I like his top game. Like he's definitely more of a, a grappler. If he gets the fight to the ground, he likes to you know slowly work position, work an inch at a time. He has a submission threat. I mean, hit Quinones with a super slick back take into a sub. He's got eleven subs, and then he showed against. Uh, Hani Aya, an ability to uh, avoid sh- submissions. They grapple for like 12 minutes in that fight. And just to avoid submissions for Rani Aya is, is uh, Hani Aya is really impressive. That said, I'm all over Gaffaroff here. I think he's better than Kang everywhere. I think he's more rounded. I think he's got more output. I think he's a better wrestler. I think he wins everywhere. I think he stops takedown attempts from Kang and then he just lands shots on his own. Give me Gaffaroff by decision. I. I like the, the the breakdown there, and I'm glad I made you go go first and kind of primed you with that question about uh, um, uh, about Gafarov's upside because my my feeling after watching him fight on the Contender Series as well as in the UFC is that he's he's better than zero and two in the UFC, zero and three overall, like in in the octagon, like the Castaneda fight was competitive. Saeed Nurmagomedov is just a much better fighter. He's just a better fighter, especially right now. Like Nurmagomedov is, I, I feel like he's like a, a borderline, you know, top 10 talent and Gafarov just might not be there yet, but I feel like he has the tools. I mentioned that both fighters from Tajikistan are in the UFC right now. And obviously the reason Gafarov was on the undercard and Naimov was on the main card is that Naimov was three and zero in the UFC right now. While Gafarov was zero and two. Yeah, and I should I should I should mention that I I call him Russian. Obviously, he's not Russian. He's from Tajikistan. Yeah, but I mean, it's a former Soviet republic. Yeah. It was all the Soviet Union. Yeah. You know, when we were one. Like I was in yeah. elementary school and shit. Like, give me a pass. <laughs> I, I apologize. Uh, I, I'm right. old. That should all yeah, listen, I don't want to d- insult. We we are very popular in Tajikistan. Yeah, we're like a we're whole like, stadium gonna, of people in Tajikistan yeah. are watching this on a big screen right now. Let's do our breakdowns. <laughs> Uh, I think like, we like you're very popular in Tajikistan. I'm more like a, I'm more popular than U- Uzbekistan. That's where <laughs> I'm kind of know. I think the big war that's going on, you know, like yeah. pro Keith, pro Ben, you know. Yeah. Uh, Kazakhstan is pretty even on us because yeah. you keep making fun of ZZ's two uh, wives, and I just said last night that uh, Shavkat Rachmanov's uh, hat looks like three quarters of a of a timber wolf. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're yeah. going hard on his hat. They're they're really big on Jay Petri. They're big. They're, they're they yeah. love Jay. They, Everybody they love, loves Jay Petri. They love that. They love the stats he can come up with. That's what that's yeah. what Cat is all about. And, and they're all trying to get fifty fake wins put on their record, like yeah. by Jay. And he's the one that stop them. Um, <laughs> they they but, butter up, like, butter them up. Yeah, I, I stopped short of saying that Galfarov may have the higher upside when it's all said and done than Naimov, but. Naimov being three and zero right now, and Gafarov being zero and two, they're closer than that would seem to indicate. Like Naimov is 
I mean, he's headed for his first UFC loss at some point here. It may even come on Saturday. Whereas I think Gafarov is overdue for a win. And I'm with you in that this is a good matchup for that because Kong is a, is a bigger name. He's been in the UFC for a long time and he has, a, I mean, even now where you can tell that he's starting to slow, uh, he's 36 and it is starting to catch up to him. He's still winning three to lose one every time out. This is about as winnable a matchup for Gafrov as they could get this high up the ladder. Uh, and I think it might just come down to Gafarov being able to take Kong down and Kong either just not being able to get up or being willing to concede and try to work off his back. You pointed out that Kong is a willing wrestler, but it's almost like an American funk style wrestler in that he doesn't really have the entries to just get a solid single or double leg and plant a guy on his ass, but his, his takedown attempts often seem intended to create scrambles where he can get going what he really is good at, which is back takes opportunistic stuff that happens in transition. I don't know if that's a valid mo like route to victory against Gafarov. I could see Khan getting stuck on the bottom and getting busted up by surprise, surprisingly powerful ground ground and pound. Uh, since we're on the gag of comparing Mu and Gafarov to Fedor Emelianenko, uh, he does share the ability to get in powerful ground and pound from guard on taller guys, just by kind of throwing big looping stuff up there. Uh, yeah, I, I lean toward Gafarov by decision and I could see it being one where, yeah, it's 29, 28, but it feels more lopsided than that. And Kong was pretty beat up at the end of it. Uh, give me Gafarov by decision here as well. Welterweights take the cage next as Renat Fakradinov and Nicholas Dalby collide like two freight trains. Uh, both of them have a ton of momentum. One of them is going to come to a halt. We'll find out who. Uh, Fakradinov, the 32-year-old Russian, is 21-1-1 and overall. He's 3-0-1 since joining the UFC uh, a little over two years ago. He had that draw in his last appearance. It was a majority draw against Eliseo Zaleski dos Santos last November at UFC Fight Night Almeida versus Lewis. Prior to that, his UFC run had started with three straight wins over Andreas Mihailidis, Brian Battle, and Kevin Lee. Uh, Fakradinov will try to keep his octagon mark unbeaten and get back in the win column against Dalby. 39-year-old uh, from Denmark is 23-4-1 with two no contests overall. He's 7-3-1 with one no contest in the UFC. That's across two separate stints with the promotion. Since returning to the UFC as an outgoing Cage Warriors champ a couple of years ago, he is 6-1 with one no contest. He's on a four-fight win streak. Uh, he fought three times last year, picking up wins over Warley Alves, Muslim Salikov, and in November, at that same Almeida versus Lewis card, Gabriel Bonfim, whom he knocked out late in the second round. Dalby, author of one of the more remarkable career resurgences in recent memory, uh, owner of some serious momentum in one of the UFC's toughest divisions, nonetheless enters the cage as a prohibitive underdog as Fakradinov is minus 320, Dalby plus 260. Keith, when are we going to start believing in Nicholas Dalby? The man's on a four-fight win streak. Uh, he was a bigger <laughs> underdog than this to Gabriel Bonfim. Like, Bonfim was one of the anointed you know, poster yeah. children of the future of this welterweight division and Dalby 39 years. I'm yeah. Well, yeah. no 38. Cause that fight took place a couple weeks before his 39th birthday. So 38 years of age and all took the artillery from bone theme came back and, you know, just wore him down, wore him out, beat him up, finished it in the second round. It's, yeah. it's a feel good story. Like obviously we yeah. talked about this, but he had, I mean, he had an early run in the UFC that it wasn't bad. Like he went like one and two or two and one, something like that. It wasn't bad. He was just another guy. He got cut. Uh, he admittedly had like problems with alcoholism and depression injuries. He kind of came out of nowhere to put a win streak together in cage warriors, uh, won the welterweight title. And again, winning a welterweight title in cage warriors generally portends good things in the UFC. Just ask Ian Gary, just ask. I mean, there, there have been numerous ones. Like he's he's better now than he ever was before. Like physically, he looks better. He has better rounded skills. He's at the age when 
most fighters, especially fighters who've been in as many wars as he has, are falling apart. And he is still winning fights by outlasting younger, faster, more athletic, more offensively potent fighters, and then taking over late. Like, when are we going to start believing in this guy? Do you believe in him against Renat Fakhradinov, or are we going to be wrong again? Uh, (laughs) So me and my friend John used to have this joke. He'd be like, they'd be like, you know, do you believe in fill an athlete and like well, i believe he exists <laughs> that'd be asking me you know <laughs> um, uh i think we stole that joke from somebody i don't remember but <laughs> uh dude the guy is i'm looking at his record he's six one in one since returning to the ufc yep and oh no six one in one no contest did he right did he beat Jesse Ronson or did Jesse beat him? Oh, no. Uh, Ronson, like, uh, tested positive. Oh, so uh, Ronson like he tested... Yeah. Ronson tapped out Dolby pretty quickly, but then he blew his post fight drug screening badly, like, bad, like, got suspended for two years bad. Uh, okay. So it was reverted to a no contest. I don't remember Jesse Ronson that much. All right. So so he's got this incredible record. He, he's four and you know, wins in a row in the UFC and then not a ba- against bad no, guys. Dude, like Muslim imagine. Salikov and Gabriel Bonfim are like good top fighting quality guys. Yeah. Like he, I was shocked when you said, what would you say? Like, in fact, we did off. It's over. Like it was like pretty, you said he's over minus three twenty. That's fucking nuts. And that's, what that's is... the best line. Like <laughs> there are some out there where he's like minus 400 uh, for what it's worth. Gabriel Bonfim was like minus four fifty against yeah, that's Dolby. Crazy. Dolby, yeah. dude, Dolby's my kind of guy. The dude is a dog. He's just um, I put in my notes for last. He's a mentally strong guy. The he doesn't break when it gets bad. He's got great output. He just beats guys with his pressure. He's got good striking. He's constantly switching stands and getting you guessing. A lot of a lot of variety in his attack. Now he has some defensive holes. Uh, one, he just he trusts his chin a little too much. He's one of these guys he wants to get in the pocket. And he's gonna he knows he's gonna eat some shots to keep the pressure on his opponent, and he lacks head movement. And he can be a little too aggressive, overextending on his shots. Also, you know, leave him be countered. But he's got underrated power. He's got a big kicking game. He loves his teep kicks. He loves his like Holly Holmes side push kick. He's an underrated wrestler. Uh, he's a weak defensive wrestler. I mean, Cody Silva took him down a bunch of times, but he can sub you when he gets the ground. He's got four subs. He showed how tough he is to submit when he avoided all the submission attacks from Claudio Silva, a good grappler, all the submission attacks from Gabriel Bronfin. And he has the cardio. He is not going to stop. He's going to go as hard as he possibly can for 15 minutes. Fakradino's tough, too. He's an action fighter. He's got usually got nine stop pressure. He wants to get in the pocket. And he wants to throw bombs. He wings really hard, looping shots. He swings wild. One of the biggest overthrowers there is in the game. But if he connects, I mean, he's got the power. But he's got 11 knockouts. His check left hook is one of his best strikes. I like that he goes to the body. I mean, he hurt. I mean, it would be a draw against Dos Santos. But, I mean, he hurt Dos Santos. He dropped him with a body shot. He's a good wrestler, very fast entries. He's got six submission wins. He subbed Kevin Lee really fast. This, this is a really – I'll say this. Like th- this line should be w- way, way closer. That's not a knock on, on Fakhradinov. It's more of um, the, the continued like hate of <laughs> Nicholas Dolby for some reason. Fakhradinov has great. I mean, he's he's a great fighter. And he's got tons of skills, but Dolby is just this badass dude. I expect Dolby to press the action. The one issue I have is he's too hittable, and Fakhradinov hits too hard. I think Fakhradina hurts Dolby a bunch of times, maybe in the first second. I'm not saying he like knocks him, but he he hits him with some big shots. I mean, he might drop or anything like that. But I think he gasses. I think Dolby's going to come hard in the third. The the problem is, dude. I think Dolby runs out of time. I, I'm going to stay with Fakhradina. I'm going to say Fakhradina wins unanimous decision, but it's going to be one of those ones where it. It's much closer. It, the fight to me is way closer than this line says. Like. Don't bet on fuck reading it off. Don't get him in a DraftKings lineup and don't pay that price. Like to me, Dolby is a parley buster. So I'm kind of hedging my bets here because I'm a, I'm a big Dolby guy. I hate, I hate picking against guys that I know are underrated. I think Dolby's one of them. 
but I'm still going to go with Frank Rodinoff, but not at those odds. But give me Frank Rodinoff, I'll say, you know what? I see WK makes it super close. I see it comes down to split decision. <laughs> oh, I saw, I saw someone point out that I take like a shitload of split decisions hey, last time. And I pointed out, like, dude, you know there's going to be a couple per card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, no, yeah, it was funny. I know the guy was just like, I was like, I was like, oh, damn, I didn't realize I think that many. Uh, speaking of last card, though, dude, the the consensus underdog picks keep locking, man. We are we are killing it. I think we, we, we two, are two of them yesterday. Uh, well, there was at least the one. Oh, like we had two. But okay, D- didn't didn't we both take um, he stand and upset? Oh, you no. took Armfield. You were going to I right. Took Ar- he- I took Armfield, and I sh- I was wrong. But like, you were. We both took. We both took Van, but he they fell off the card. Oh, okay. That was the other one. Okay. Yeah, but uh, Fugit uh, played out for us. What Fugit, I've learned yeah. is that when I take a uh, an upset and you don't, I sometimes like leave hang myself out there to dry. Yeah. <laughs> but he stand. I thought you were like big on it, and then you didn't you like switch it or yeah, not like just that? because. Uh, it's because Brad Katona had just fought, and I remembered Armfield versus oh, yeah, Katona, yeah. and I yeah. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Anyway, I I love the pick there because again, these guys fought at the same card in São Paulo mm-hmm. last fall, and the whole reason that Fakradinov and Eliseo Zaleski dos Santos ended up in a draw is because Fakradinov was tooling him for two rounds, and then uh elizeo capoeira put a 10-8 round on him in the third round and what we, what can we say about capoeira he's like a guy pushing 40 who's still tough and gritty despite you know his kind of flashy skill set uh, mm-hmm. elizeo zaleski dos santos basically did the nicholas dalby game plan against fakradina and, and fought him to a draw i see that happening here i I, I would never pick a draw. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> no, I'm not saying I'm not saying I would <laughs> never. Pick, I would pick a draw because I mean I can see that happening here. That Fakradinov wins the first two rounds, like no 10-8 rounds there, but two clear 10-9 rounds where he's in control of the fight. He's Dolby's busted up. He's got that Danish tan where he bleeds and turns red. Yeah, <laughs> someone touches him, he looks like a mess, and all of a sudden Fakradinov is sucking wind in the last two minutes of the second round, you're like, oh shit, it's Dolby time. Dolby takes him down, gets a big slam. He's he's starting to pound on him at the end of round two. And all of a sudden we have a fight. Can Dolby get that 10-8 round in the third round? Or can he get a finish? I'm so close to picking him. It, I'm Dolby's almost a three to one underdog. And I just feel like I can see this one clear as day, but I'm kind of with you, man. I, I think that's the dynamic we get, but Dolby doesn't, get quite enough time to do enough damage to get the 10, eight round in the third round or get the finish. If he does it, I'm going to be kicking myself for the rest of the year. But yeah, I, I think Fakradino basically survives outlast and kind of sits on his lead against, uh, against Dolby. And it pains me to say it because Dolby did this in his last outing against a younger guy with higher upside like he was in the co-main event mostly to put Gabriel Bonfim over and he completely spoiled it. Like give me Fakradinov by decision as well, but uh, it's yeah, I I think we're in for a show and I think uh, we're going to get another display by Nicholas Dalby, even if it's not quite enough to get his hand raised. Next up at UFC Saudi Arabia, you made the joke in our previous bout preview about, well, do you believe in Fighter X? Well, I believe he exists. Well, we're about to get some of that because the UFC just put Nazrat Hakparast and Kelvin Gastelum on the same card, forever dispelling my conspiracy theory that they're actually the same guy. Yeah. Uh, next up at UFC <laughs> Saudi Arabia is a lightweight clash between Nazrat Hakparast and Jared Gordon. Uh <laughs> He's, except when G- Gaslam comes out and he's like, that's weird. Didn't, didn't Hakparas have that injury at the end of the fight? It's like, man, Gaslam's got a six pack, dude. He looks great. <laughs> yeah, dude. G- Gaslam has a six pack. It's like freaking Bud Lights. <laughs> or, or, uh, uh, <laughs> what's that? Or, or, what's the freaking official bear? The stupid commercials with freaking Sorrell and shit. Oh, no. yeah, for those with a fighting spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, but, but the UFC's back with Bud Light now, so. Uh, oh, they're back with Bud Light. Yeah. 
communists. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hack for us. Don't at me. Don't at me. Just joking. <laughs> oh. Hey, Keith and I both have our reasons for not drinking Bud Light. Uh, I don't drink it because it's gross. Uh, Hack Parast, the 28-year-old Moroccan by way of Germany, is 16-5 and five overall. He is 8-4 and four in the UFC. He's on a three-fight win streak. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that because he's Nazarat Hack Parast, it dates back almost two full years. But uh, he comes into this uh, fight on the back of back-to-back to back wins over John McDessie, Landon Quinones, and Jamie Malarkey. The most recent of those, the Malarkey fight, was back in December at UFC Fight Night Song versus Gutierrez, where Hawk Paras just lamped him uh, early in the first round. He will look to make it four in a row and uh, remind the lightweight division that, hey, he's still just 28 years old and he's got some skills. Uh, in order to do so, he's going to have to get past Gordon. 35-year-old New Yorker is 20 and 6 with one no contest overall. He is 8 and 5 with one no contest in the UFC. He is coming in uh, off of a win as well. Uh, he fought at UFC 295 where he spoiled the lightweight foray of Mark O. Madsen with a first round knockout. So uh, he's looking to build on that momentum. He is not favored to do so. Hawk Parast is minus 255, Gordon plus 205 on the comeback. I'm always a little surprised as you know, when I put together the outlines for these cards at a few fighters ages and a few fighters, like number of fights in the UFC, just, you know, time gets funny, but time gets funny when you're a fan for as long as we have been. And it gets funny when you've been covering every card in and out for years, like you and I have been like, I was surprised that Nazrat Hawk is still just he hasn't even turned 29 yet just he's been in the UFC for such a long time uh just I expected like I knew he was young when he landed in the UFC but I expected that he was over 30 by now he's still not he's still got some good things going for him man he's I I mean he's almost like like there's a little bit of Moroccan Drew Dober to him where he has a a narrow <laughs> A narrowly <laughs> circumscribed <laughs> set of skills. Sorry, man. I, I think Drew Dober has turned it to, you, to your own Bo Nickel. <laughs> you gotta get Drew Dober in there. <laughs> like, I, Drew Dober is not one of the people that we have previewed the most, but he's the guy with the highest ratio of mentions to the number of fights we, we've previewed, like Ian Nickel. We, someone needs to take it. We need to get someone, like, like who, who could keep t- – keep stats for us like uh oh Marcus Mustard would be good at it how many times how many times can ben mention like how, how many people can ben compare to drew dober I mean, well, just th- somebody should make a bingo card and like the bingo card for me has like drew dober and Trey yeah. ogden on it like <laughs> how many how many middleweights can we match up against brad tavares to yeah. be another one <laughs> everybody fights tavares all right we do that we do we do the recap show and they're like what's next for this guy we pick brad tavares three different times yeah. <laughs> but i hack Perust, it's not like his skills have like he hasn't turned into a whole different fighter in in the years he's been in the UFC. He's still a, like, he's still a crisp boxer with surprisingly good power. Uh, he does. You, you don't expect it. Cause he doesn't really overswing on stuff, but he just has the power that seems to come from natural mechanics and good technique where when he's, when he's, it's working well and he's sitting down on his punches, everything he throws like snaps the other guy's head back and it either hurts him and, the fun is on or it at least changes their game plan. Like he's turned some strikers into wrestlers uh, over his UFC run. And while he's gotten outclassed by a few people, like, I mean, he got knocked. Uh, he actually fought Dober and got knocked out early guys that are either like just more like have a deeper striking game than him. Like Bobby green kind of outclassed him, you know, green's just a, a better, more diverse striker uh, hooker and Dober, uh, you know, well, I mean, again, Dober just knocked him out. But uh, but aside from that, like, he he knocked out Jamie Malarkey. And that's the kind of fight where Jamie Malarkey used to be able to walk through the big punches and find a way to, if not win, at least stay in the fight. And we may look back and realize that that's just a reflection on, oh, Malarkey's getting old fast. But in the moment when I saw Hawk Pross do it, I thought, damn, that's that's an achievement. That's a, that's uh 
that's a feather in the cap for him. And beyond that, all of his other skills just sort of go to make that work. He just, he's a specialist where the rest of his skill set just exists to let him exercise that. Like he throws some kicks, he throws some good kicks, but they're mostly to give his opponents something to think about, you know, while he wastes the clock you with his hands. Uh, he's a decent def defensive wrestler and he can wrestle offensively, but he doesn't choose to use them. Like all of it points to somebody that's going to be a problem for Jared Gordon to deal with. Uh, Gordon is, I mean, for a guy that has fought at featherweight various times in his uh, UFC career, in fact, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure whether half his fights have been at featherweight, but some of them have been. Uh, I don't think he's going to be especially undersized compared to Hawk Parast, but he's a, a guy who's, he he ends up having to to kind of wade into the pocket to make all the rest of his game work. Like he, he can be a pretty good wrestler and grappler, but he ends up, like he doesn't have great entries from the outside. So he ends up having to spend some time in the danger zone in order to make his ground game work. He can be a, a pretty good pocket boxer, but he's not the Dustin Poirier type of guy that is dodging bullets in there in matrix time while he's waiting to set up his own shots. He usually has to take some to give some, all of that is just rough sledding against a guy like Nasrat Hakparast, who's accurate hits hard and is going to be bigger than Gordon. Yeah. Gordon's incredibly tough but he has been stopped, you know, before he, he I mean, Charles Oliveira knocked him out of his boots. I kind of see that coming against Hawk Parast. Like I, I hate underestimating Gordon. I feel like I, I underestimate him and write off his chances a lot, but yeah, this just feels like a bad matchup to me. And despite the fact that Hawk Parast is extremely injury prone, like Gordon is the guy that's much older and, part of the benefit of being a, a once a year fighter like Hawk Paras is that like Gordon is taking like three fights worth of wear for every fight that Hawk Paras has had. So if one guy has, t has slipped at all, it's more likely to be Gordon. I think that tells just the matchup dynamic, the, the wear and tear on Gordon. I think Hawk Paras like finds the finish here. Give me Hawk Paras by a third round TKO at the end of a fight where he's been busting up Gordon pretty bad the whole time. Wow. I, um, Man, I, I we going over this card, and I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm starting to think I should should have given a higher grade than a B plus. It's like there's not a fight other than like the road to UFC fight, and I feel like it's almost like that's not even part of the actual, you know, fan yeah. play. It's like if I'm if I'm if I'm like walking to inside a concert and there's like a lineup and you have like. <laughs> you know our favorite Leonard Skinner playing and ZZ Top <laughs> and maybe like I don't know Bad Companies the opening band but then there's like a guy juggling in the park line on my way there does that count as part of the entertainment that I watched the juggler for like 30 seconds that's why I feel like the road to UFC is and you know what if the UFC just flat out said from now on every card like whether it's a pay-per-view or a free card is going to have one contender series fight fight at the very beginning we it would take us a month to get used to it, and then it wouldn't even affect how we rated these cards anymore. It'd just be part of the reality, and we'd judge it based on what yeah. it is. Well, is it a good contender series fight, or is it a lousy one? Like, I, I feel that way about the road to UFC fight at the beginning here. Like, I, I made fun of it for what it is. Like, I don't even think they're the best guys from road to UFC. Not why is it on this card? Like, it's on this card because the UFC wants to raise up Asian talent. Yeah. <laughs> I think the issue should have, like, a pecking order where the first fight, like, loser – is like you cut like you know like if i lose this fight i'm cut like how it's like a soccer that? league it's just like relegation like if you're at the That's bottom it. you're gone you're <laughs> cut you lose that one and then like the guy who wins moves on and he can go he goes he can move up higher up the card i love that and then like you, you lose if you're the second fight on the card and you lose your next fight is the opener like you you've dropped to the opener Ooh, that's <laughs> brilliant <laughs> I, also, I also think i like a fight a fight organization should have just i think i heard someone else say this i'm gonna be stealing from someone i apologize if i stole it just have car fights from like 125 to 170 that's like you're, no heavyweights no nothing like your heavyweight champions 170 <laughs> how is it how exciting what, would that be what if they set them up like like high school dual meet wrestling cards where you just went from the lightest to the heaviest like how cool would that be yeah but like my heaviest would be like 170 i want to go any higher than that 
Like, I don't want to oh, and so like, but the, so the highest being 170, topping out at 185. It's not like 170 pounders would have to fight heavyweights. It's just it's not no, no, like, like, like your weight class is welterweight. Like that's the heaviest weight class is welterweight. Oh, that's oh, sweet. it. <laughs> cool like, you know like like if victor doesn't keep going up you know they have like you know okay, or whatever they're highest so weight class 145 or whatever 145, that's how it'd yeah. be that's how it'd be for my because it'd be like 170 it'd be the highest like it, uh, it'd be more fun though dude i'd rather watch that than the promotion that was just 185 through two uh through heavyweight <laughs> i was thinking yeah. this you know you know and victor is just all women what if you had an organization with just flyweights just men's flyweights the entire freaking organization <laughs> no that'd be class. fantastic yeah. You don't, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, like you know, like in like pro wrestling, they have like the Lucha Libres, but they're all like little small, like an organization of Lucha Libres. Like, same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hell, if you want, you can even freaking have them wear a mask <laughs> for some reason when they fight each other. Freaking <laughs> Dos Caras style. Uh, anyways, so as far as this fight, this is, I, I like this fight. I, Jerry Gordon, man, he, he's not a great athlete, but the dude just makes up for me just being tough as hell, dude. He's got a much better record in the UFC than people think. He's he's got good output on the feet. He's technically sound, tight boxing. He 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 just isn't the athlete to make his striking dangerous. Like he he could win, but I mean like he's he's not very explosive. He doesn't have much power. He has some defensive holes. He keeps his hands low. He pillars, which you know I'm not a fan of. But he can he can still win a fight with his striking. He gets inside. He's mean. He can get in the clinch. He wear you down in the clinch. He's got good clinch striking. I mean, we, he beat up Patty Pimble in the clinch. He beat up Mark Masson in the clinch. He's an underrated wrestler. I think I always go back to like the Chris Fishko fight where he out wrestled Chris Fishko, which was impressive. He was on top. He's a good, good grappler from on top. Strong top game. Good ground and pound. Uh, he can he can grab a submission. Hot press. I like what you said. Like this is a guy that he he's. There was times where I was like, oh, this guy looks really good. Then I kind of was like, oh, he, he isn't who he is. But now he's kind of like coming back up again where, where he's starting to show really good. Southpaw, I like his volume on the feet. Good counter striker. He uses feints really well to set up his openings. I see. You mentioned his hand speed is good. He's explosive. He really whips his punches. His left hand is his best strike. Really clean shots. He attacks with combinations. He can be a little wild, uh, but he's good, good power. Like he has the power. Like not, he's not like blashing the next week like we talk about him and Kelvin Gaslam look like each other <laughs> and Kelvin there was talking about how hard Kelvin Gaslam punch <laughs> I think Hawk Frost might be actually the power the, the power puncher of the two uh he gets inside he throws a lot of uppercuts he loves to close the distance uh you know and and, and get inside look for uppercuts very like Junior Dos Santos style uh but you know when you throw a big shot you you, you know you, you take a chance of getting hit yourself my issue is he tends to throw some combinations and stop and almost like you know, fights at like a sim- same rhythm, the same pace. So he kind of lacks that killer instinct and he's kind of like, he'll look and he kind of admire his work a little bit instead of, you know, going in and trying to finish his, his opponent. Uh, I also like going against a Bobby Green fight. If he's going against like a better striker, like you mentioned, he doesn't adjust his game plan. If something isn't working, he just keeps trying it. Like he was kept throwing the same wing and counter left, which is not, like I said, is his best strike. But Green was having, I mean, he started coming over and over again. So he's got to make that adjustment. Uh, he, he also hardly ever wrestles, though he did take John McDessie down in, in their fight, which was good. Uh, he has good takedown defense. It isn't perfect, but he's, you know, he's hard to take down. Uh, more impressive than hard to take down, he's hard to hold down. Like like Dan Hooker took him down, Marcin Held way back there, Alex Munoz took him down, but like none of them could hold him down. I think this is a good scrap. I I am with you. I'm leaning Hawk for us. I think he's faster. He has more power. Uh, I do expect Gordon to come after him. If Gordon can turn this into a grappling match, Gordon can win. But on the feet, I, Gordon has good vibe. But Hawk Ross hits harder. He's faster. I think both will have their moments. I think it's a closer fight than the betting line says. I, I think it could be really close just because Gordon has a little bit of Dolby in him. Where he's 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 going to make it annoying. It's never going to be a clean fight against Gordon. You're not going to just out there. You know, go out there and run through him. I mean, I mean, it could happen, but it's like it's not likely. Um, yeah, I'll, you know what? Just for hell, I'll say hot for us. I'll say by split decision. All right. <laughs> Next up at UFC Saudi Arabia, as we record this Sunday night, uh, we just discovered the breaking news from friend of the show and regular on our recaps, uh, Marcel Dorf, our, our man in, in Amsterdam, that 
Never Melzik really Bagdazarian is out of his main card fight against Muhammad Naimov. One, that's a bummer because it was one of the better, more evenly matched uh, bouts on the card. But two, it trims this uh, card back to 11 fights. And whether they find a replacement opponent for Naimov or not, there's every chance that the bout order gets shuffled now. But at least as of right now, this is scheduled to be the top prelim. It is a middleweight contest between undefeated Shara Boutin, Shara Bullet, Magomedov, and late replacement Joelton Luderbach. Magomedov, the 30-year-old Russian, is 12-0 and overall. He's 1-0. Uh, since joining the UFC late last year, he made his debut at UFC 294 in October, taking a unanimous decision over Bruno Silva. He will look to make it 2-0, uh, continue to juice up the considerable uh, hype and buzz around him. He had been scheduled to take on Igor Pateria, but uh, Pateria withdrew uh, a week or two ago. In steps, late replacement uh, Luderbach. 31-year-old Brazilian by way of Germany is 38 and 9 with one no contest overall. Uh, this will be his UFC debut. He's fought all over the place. He was part of the Professional Fighters League 2021 regular season at lightweight of all things, but he has fought all up and down the scale. He's fought from lightweight to uh, to middleweight throughout his career. He's uh, strung together a couple wins at uh, welterweight and middleweight in Brave CF. He makes his debut here. He is unsurprisingly an underdog to the undefeated Shara Bullet. Uh, Magomedov around minus 240. Luderbach plus 190 or so coming back. It's, obviously, I mentioned this off the top. The UFC is dying to find... Well, right now it's dying to find the, the original Hamzat Shemaev. Who knows where the hell he is or what he's doing. But it's also looking for the next Hamzat Shemaev. And Shara Bullet as a guy that has kind of a similar build, like a tall, narrow, but jacked middleweight who has a kind of, I mean, he has a distinctive thing to his, to his look. He has a distinctive look to him. Like obviously Shamayev has the, the hair lip repair. Shara bullet has the freaky demon eye that, I mean, nobody's even sure whether he's actually sighted in that eye or not. It, it, he's, he looks created by central casting to be the next Hamzat Shemaev. He's not Hamzat Shemaev. Because the whole thing about Hamzat Shemaev is he is an incredible wrestler and topside grappler who has learned to become a quick strike knockout artist. Magomedov is a kickboxer first who it's still kind of anybody's guess how good of a wrestler he is against high level competition because he has simply not faced good people coming up. His regional uh, highlight reel looks incredible, but it's mostly him just teeing off on guys that are either much older, much smaller, much less skilled, or pick any two of the three and slap them together. That did make it heartening when he had his uh, debut against Bruno Silva because while while Silva has definitely regressed to the mean after landing in the UFC with a splash himself, he's still a kind of quality middle of the pack 185 pounder who is a big strong guy and is a surprisingly good wrestler for somebody who presents as a kickboxer himself. And Magomedov won, no question. That was going to make the Eor Pateria fight kind of an interesting next test, and Magomedov was shaping up to be a big favorite over uh, Pateria as well. But Pateria is a guy that was going to be coming down from 205 pounds, is a good striker himself, and was going to be at least as big as Shara Bullet. So just another appropriate test while the UFC figures out what they have with this guy. Luderbach is, I, they, they did what they had to, to keep Shara Bullet on this card. Uh, I mean, if you were in Dana's office and, you were looking at his whiteboard. If there was a, a note anywhere on the whiteboard, like who's the most important person to keep on this card, I would say outside of the main event, Shara Bullet is probably the most important person for the UFC to keep in this card. Like, you know, he's uh, he's someone that they see star potential in. So they did what they did they needed to to keep him on the card. But to any of us that remember Joelson Luderbach getting pieced up on the feet by Clay Collard, a lightweight in PFL, 
we have a feeling what this is going to look like. Uh, the good news about Luderbach is that he was an incredibly long and lanky lightweight. I mean, he has more of a frame built for welterweight or middleweight, but in PFL, he was just a long, skinny, lightweight, and he was at a decided speed disadvantage against people like Collard and Haush Monfio. He couldn't stop Collard from getting inside and landing boxing combinations on him. That spells bad news against someone who's as big, as fast, and hits with as much power as uh, Magomedov. Luderbach has a good ground game. Like, uh, he has a good grappling game. He has good, like, I mean, he has he has good jujitsu off his back, where uh, instead of just being content to throw up low percentage stuff from the bottom, he's good at throwing up sub attempts that allow him to kind of unseat the guy on top and allow him at least to sweep or escape. Uh, he does have kind of lanky man submissions where he is quick to grab the back and transition or quick to slap on uh, a front headlock and work off a front headlock series, either, you know, when escaping to his feet or in defending takedown attempts where, you know, he'll, he'll throw on the front headlock and not just fall to guard with a guillotine though. He has done that as well, but just use it to kind of neutralize the takedown attempt, you know, threaten and, and return to his feet. But he doesn't really have flat out offensive wrestling to, that's really going to test Mega Madoff or get him outside of his comfort zone. Really, the the line the line is probably about right where Mega Madoff is like a two and a half to one favorite. But the only clear route to victory I could see for Luderbach is if Mega Madoff is teeing off on him but can't manage to knock him out and mysteriously starts to gas out because it's one of the one of the unknowns about Shara Bullet at this point is how his gas tank will look in fights where, you know, things aren't completely going his way. Uh, that That's a slim thing to hang your hopes on if you're looking for upset potential in Joelton Luderbach. I think Magomedov gets it done. Uh, Luderbach is going to be stuck either in a kickboxing match with someone who has more power, is a little bigger, and Magomedov hits with power at all ranges. He's good inside as well as outside. Or if he sells out to try to get this thing to the ground, he's going to have to kind of cross no man's land to get there. And I think Magomedov punishes him on the inside with knees, elbows. Yeah, th this is rough sledding for Luderbach. I think Magomedov gets the knockout, and I think he probably gets it in the first round. Again, Magomedov, dude, this guy. <laughs> this dude is a real-life villain. I love it. Like, I, I not love it. Like, like he looks the part. He lives the part. I, I've talked about his controversy already. So, in, in his last time I previewed him, not 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 to the extent of uh, Sajikas Dumas. So, but <laughs> you gotta check out this guy. He's like punching people at jujitsu tournaments, fighting people on elevators and shit, or escalators, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, and he looks at he's wears like a freaking eye patch and uh, the guy's the guy's like he's got like a dead eye like he he uh, <laughs> he you watched the Sopranos right yes do you remember that beef in with like New York and, and spoiler if you never watched the Sopranos and there's like a little short guy who's like his eyes all messed up and it makes him like scarier looking mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> like he's a Russian one of that guy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't remember the guy's well, name. And and I mean, there are some pictures of him, like on the regional scene, where he's wearing like the Muay Thai like headdress and armbands, and he's looking out with the eye, and it just literally looks like a still from a '90s kickboxing movie. Like yeah. he's, he's the villain, yeah, the bad guy. You got to fight yeah. like Doc Claude Van Dam at the end. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, is that the Russian Tong Po? He's just gonna like yeah. his hands and glass. And, yeah. <laughs> uh so he, the, the guy's a dynamic striker. I, I mean, he's got professional kickboxing experience. He moves well, very athletic, very good distance striker, fast hands, crisp jab, tax with the combination. I mean, the guy he hits hard. He's got 10 KOs, I think seven in the first round. Really good kicking game, hard calf kicks, hook kicks, body kicks. Uh, he will throw him naked, so he's, he's open to counters off of those, though. I absolutely love his step in knees. I mean, they're a thing of beauty. Uh, he, I love that he'll throw step in knees to hit offensively, but he'll also throw them defensively when he's at distance trying to get his opponents coming in and shooting on him. 
Now he's not much of an offensive wrestler, and his Achilles heels is his terrible defensive wrestling. And it's I don't know if it's even that his takedown defense, but his last fight, he had no urgency to go to the bottom. Or some people will point out, I'll say no urgency. Some people would just say he simply can't get out of the bottom. He doesn't have the skill. Uh, he was spending so much time on his back. Well, he does land strikes from his back. I mean, his last fight, he was he was throwing mean elbows from his back. So, so that he might have that thing where he doesn't realize he's losing by being on his back. Uh, Letterbach. He, he sounds like he owns a freaking uh, popcorn company. <laughs> Jolted Letterbach. Or, 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 Orvin Luder. <laughs> yeah. He's a Orvin Luderbacher. Yeah, he's a no, Brazilian. No, right. he's, got the, he's got the popcorn country <laughs> company in Brazil. Uh, the dude has a lot of MMA experience, but he, what I also like, well, he's got a lot of combat experience. I mean, the guy's got boxing matches, Muay Thai matches, karate matches, kickboxing matches. Uh, he's competed in BJJ competitions. Uh, so he he, li- he likes to fight. <laughs> like, I don't know, he's probably freaking arm wrestling somebody right now. Who knows what he's doing? Freaking thumb wars. <laughs> but oh, it's like Anthony Smith. He's waiting to play like Call of Duty with him. Like just. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's you know, I mean, picturing his shadow boxes somewhere doing something. Uh, he's he's pretty well rounded. I think I'm a little higher on him than you are. He's not a great athlete. He's kind of flat footed, but he's a brawler on the feet. He, he can be wild. He has good power. He's got 14 TKOs. Uh, he he. I'm worried about defensively. He, he carries his hands low. Uh, he wrestles a lot, though. He's very physically strong. He gets to the clinch. He likes upper body takedowns. Nice trips. Uh, he hit that like Henry Sudo inside uh, in his last fight. That's like you know the the upper body clinch, and you do that inside trip, which is the Henry Sudo's go to move. He's got 13 subs on his record, uh, though he's uh, he's a weaker defensive wrestler himself. Magomedov has way more upside. I mean, he, I mean, his striking is absolutely incredible. If he could fix his takedown defense or or even improve his his get up game, like he doesn't have to be like oh, Jose Aldo, you can't take me down. He could be Alex Pajeda, where yeah, I can be taken down, but I'm gonna find a way to get back up, or I'm gonna stall for time and then make you pay when we stood back up. If he can do that, he could be really elite. If Ludabaka stands with Magomedov, dude's getting plunked. And, and and like I said, Ludabaka has a lot of striking experience, but he get he'll get knocked out. Thing is, I don't think he will. I think he's going to close the distance immediately if he's smart, you know. And I think he's going to trip him down to the ground, and I think he's going to do it over and over again. I think this is going to be a big setback for Magomedov. I'm going with the upset. I'm taking I'm taking uh, I'm taking Ludabaka to to get Mega made of town, start to gas him a little bit, be by being on top. And I think Ludabaka locks in a sub. I'm going to say Ludabaka subs him in the third round. Big upset. Whoa, big upset pick for Keith. Like, so check it out, folks. Uh, th- this is what, this is why. And we're all eating popcorn on the, on, the, on the recap show. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Or as he would call it, since he's Brazilian, a pipoca. That's that's Portuguese for for popcorn. <sighs> I, okay, I, I, I know, know, I know, explain that to I you know too many languages, and <laughs> uh, you had to show off that you could speak Portuguese, but then you had to explain to me like I couldn't figure out that you. I ruined it, didn't Portuguese. I? <laughs> <laughs> Next up at UFC on ABC Six is a light heavyweight clash between Johnny Walker and Volkan Uzdemir. Walker. The 32-year-old Brazilian by way of Scotland, by way of Ireland, is 21 and 8 with one no contest overall. He is 7 and 5 with one no contest since joining the UFC out of the first season of Dana White's Contender Series Brazil. He is coming into this fight on the back of a loss and on the back of his strange two-fight series with Magomed Ankalaev, where their first fight last October was... Uh, rendered a no contest after an illegal knee. Then they met back up again in the headliner of UFC Fight Night 234 this January, and Ankalaev knocked him out in the second round to put an end uh, to that strange rivalry. He will look to get back in the win column here against Uzdemir. The 34-year-old from Switzerland is 19-7 and seven overall. He is 7-6 and six in the UFC. He is coming into this fight off the momentum of his first round submission win over Bogdan Guskov at uh, UFC Paris last September. Odds here, 
another pick them both gentlemen out there around minus 110 or minus 115 on the books uh keith we've been talking about time and our perception of time i was surprised to find out or to be reminded that walker and uzdemir have the exact same number of fights in the ufc just because it feels like uzdemir has been around so much longer yeah but then i was doubly surprised to realize that they landed in the ufc within a year of each other in 2017 and 2018 just because uzdemir kind of rose to top 10 contention so quickly super fast while walker was still kind of messing around and making a splash as this you know crazy weirdo knockout artist it feels to me like Uzdemir has been around longer, but they've been in the UFC around the same amount of time. They're close in age to each other. They have the same number of fights in the UFC, yet their trajectory feels kind of different. Uzdemir feels like a guy who made his way into the title picture. I mean, he fought Daniel Cormier uh, a few years back for the title and had been kind of regressing. And then, you know, all of a sudden he looked great against Guskov and he, he flashed a little bit of the ground game, whereas Walker is kind of a known problem. He was a guy that came to the UFC with a completely unique set of physical tools. And the question has just been, can he get the mental side of the game straight enough to string together enough wins in the lowest fight IQ division in, in MMA to make it into the title picture? I, I, I love that these two guys are meeting now here like this. Uh, Uzdemir, obviously, he presents as a kickboxer. You know, he had a couple fights in Bellator way back long before he was in the UFC, but then he took at least like a year or two completely away from the sport and just focused on kickboxing for a couple years, came to the UFC. But like, despite presenting as a kickboxer, like, I I mean, he is a kickboxer, don't get me wrong, but he's not Israel Adesanya or Shara Bullet, you know, he's a big, strong guy who throws a pretty basic bread and butter repertoire of kicks and punches in combination. And there's just a lot of power on all of them. Like his kicks aren't fancy, but they are super hard. Uh, He's, you know, got big power in both hands. He's not the hugest light heavyweight, like in terms of height and wingspan, you know, but that hasn't really cost him too much, but yeah, he, he just kind of is what he is. Like Walker obviously is the, the more interesting thing. Like he is the biggest light heavyweight on the planet. Like he might not be the tallest, you know, you stack him and Ryan span and Kennedy's at uh, all up against each other. They're all around six, five. I don't know which one's the tallest, but Walker's and Walker's wingspan is within an inch of all those guys. But in terms of bulk, like what those guys are walking around at on Wednesday of fight week, I would bet money that Walker's the biggest light heavyweight on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, he, he like just once he's hydrated and he's in that cage, he looks like a 245 pound guy. Yeah, he's fucking huge. He is just gigantic. And despite that, I mean, his gas tank isn't great, but it's not like he's not one of the guys where if he doesn't get a finish in two minutes, it's all over. So despite being huge, And despite having this completely spastic striking style that really must burn a lot of energy, his durability and defensive lapses are what have cost him in his losses. It's not like Corey Anderson and Magomed Ankalaev didn't knock him silly because he gassed out. They knocked him silly early because he's a wild man and doesn't cover his chin. That leaves him open to what Volkan Uzdemir does. Like Uzdemir, he isn't as nifty as Corey Anderson or Jamal Hill or Magomed Ankalaev, but as a guy who's veteran enough not to get flustered when Walker comes flying at him with a flying kick and tries a spinning back elbow uh, and then a Superman punch all within the first 10 seconds of the fight, a guy that's not going to bite on any of that and is just going to, you know, keep his guard up and look for a chance to, you know, to throw a right cross and tag him. That's Uzdemir. So I see plenty of like potential for, for Uzdemir to win this. I, I understand why, the line is what it is. I'm tempted to read more into Uzdemir's uh, win over Bogdan Guskov than, than is necessary. Like, yeah, he took Guskov's back, wrapped up a rear naked choke, and he did it fast. Like, he's clearly a guy that does work on his grappling in the gym. The, but the, the, Sorry to interrupt you, but the, it aged well. Yeah, Guskov, because Guskov, Guskov well. went right back to knocking fools out. Like, yeah. you know, I was, I was 
kind of famously like yeah, Guskov sucks. This is this is terrible. Uh, but Guskov was actually turned out to be okay. Just Uzdemir was again veteran and smart enough to take the easier route to victory against him. Like Uzdemir probably could have beat him in a kickboxing match, but when his ground game is that unproven, why not take advantage? Uh, I, I I don't see that as something he's necessarily going to do to Johnny Walker. In fact, like I, I don't think Uzdemir probably is going to want much of Johnny Walker on the floor. Like Walker's ground and pound is terrifying. Uh, he, I mean, I, he hasn't really flexed it at the UFC level, but he does have some offensive grappling, especially some top side stuff. I expect that this plays out as a pure kickboxing match on the feet. I don't have any confidence in this pick, but Johnny Walker is somebody who's gradually been reining it in. Like it's kind of a slower, less pronounced version of what Michelle Pereira has been doing down at 170 and 185, where he's toned down the wild stuff just enough to where he's now just a good, solid offensive striker with some rare physical tools and a little sprinkle of exotic stuff on top. Like Walker's kind of headed in that direction. I'm going to say that he doesn't make any major mistakes. And if Walker doesn't make any major mistakes, I do favor him over Uzdemir uh, on just offensive uh, tools and output. So give me Walker to win a fun three round, mostly striking match over Uzdemir here, probably just win two rounds out of three. Both guys will probably have their moments, but if Uzdemir hurts Walker, you know, he'll stay composed, uh, survive and, and win at least two rounds out of three. I, I like Walker in this one. It's funny when you, when you look at ranked guys, you know, and I, I named the, you know, top fights on the, on the card. This is one of the ones that's a little lower on, on, on the list. You seem to be higher on these guys than I am. I, well, Johnny I mean, they're, they're top 10 guys in a lousy division. Like, yeah. that's all I'll say. Yeah, but I, I just – I don't see either of these guys, like, ever being, you know, fighting for a title again or even being close. I, I feel like this is even – like this is as high they're going to get, you know. Uh, work, I mean, work is huge. I mean, the, the guy would be a big heavyweight. <laughs> like, never mind mm-hmm. light heavyweight, as you mentioned. He's, he's, he's athletic. He's explosive. Uh, he used – like you mentioned, he used to be very, very wild – but he, he's 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 more reserved lately, which is a good thing. Uh, though he'll still throw all some fun spinning attacks and fl- you know flying kicks or something crazy. But uh, obviously insane power. I am just worried about his durability. I mean, the guy's been hurt a lot. I mean, Ankle I've hurt him with a body shot in, in their last fight. Jamal Hill, Corey Anderson both blasted him into like next week. Uh, he, he he got hurt by you know, he got knocked out by Ankle in, in the last fight. I think, like, we joke about him being big. I think a move to heavyweight, and I said this before his last fight, would would be a, a good move for him because I'm worried about his durability. Maybe if he's fully hydrated, you know, he'd be better. And plus, like, he, yeah, he's fast. He's explosive. He'd be even faster at, at heavyweight. Um, he's a he's a weak offensive wrestler. He's a bad defensive wrestler. Though he he tries to stop takedowns with those Travis Brown elbows, and, he you know, it's effective for someone his size. If he's on top, you know, he's got clubbing shots. We saw him sub Iwan Kutalaba, but he's gassed in the past, like against Nikita Krylov. Though his cardio looked much better against Anthony Smith, it was still a, a slower pace fight because of how big he is. He can't really press a, a really fast pace. Usamir, Usamir is a, he's a minus athlete. He's he's flat footed, not very fast. He's plotting. But what he does do well is he marches down as a foe. He works with good volume. Though I, I have said that his, I think his volume has been declining, but he was always like a pretty good volume guy for for you know this weight class. He's just short, tight boxer. He likes to slide in the mid range and land shots. His left hook being his best weapon. He does hit hard, uh, but I've always thought his power was overrated. I mean, the guy hasn't knocked out anybody in almost five years. But in fairness, he did sting um, Guskov in his last fight. Uh, you know, he, he ended up subbing him. He hurt him before that. He's a good close quarter striker. If he's in close, you know, collar ties, dirty boxing inside, he can wrestle a little bit. I mean, he got takedowns against Dominic Reyes, Anthony Smith, Paul Craig, Nikita Krauf. He's got he's got actually a bunch. Guskov, um, yeah, he he has been taking down his him, himself a lot too, though. Uh, Krylov was taking him down with ease. He struggles to get off the bottom. 
Uh, he's, he, you know, when it comes to grappling, he's definitely more of a top side grappler. He isn't, a, you know, much of a submission threat, even though, you know, he did get a sub in his last fight. I'll give him credit for his submission defense. Like, he avoids subs from Paul Craig for a long period of time. A lot of that had to do with his IQ, but not going to the ground with Paul Craig, which was smart. Uh, his cardio, like, I go back to the Krylov fight, his cardio was shot. It looked super bad. Uh, you know, like like I said, for, for ranked light heavyweights, I'm not very high in either. Walker is a better athlete. He hits harder. I think he's a better striker. Ustamir, I think, has the edge in the grappling. I want to go with you. I'm going to go with Walker. I think he lands the harder shots. But unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be like the spectacular finish or anything. I think both guys are going to gas. I think it's going to get ugly. I think we're going to have an ugly like battle for light heavyweights that unfortunately goes to a decision. Give me Walker by decision. Next up at UFC Saudi Arabia, and as the card is currently constituted, at least third from the top is a welterweight clash between Kelvin Gastelum and Daniel Rodriguez. Gastelum, the 32 year old Arizonan, is 18 and nine with one no contest overall. He is 12 and nine in the UFC since joining uh, as the middleweight winner of uh, season 17 of The Ultimate Fighter. He Dropped to welterweight, missed weight a few times, was more or less forced by the UFC to move up to middleweight. Uh, he has dropped back down to welterweight and had better success on the scale, uh, if not in the cage. But he is five and three at welterweight in the UFC, and he is coming off a loss. Uh, he fought in December at UFC on ESPN, Darius versus Sarukian, where he was tapped out by Sean Brady in the third round at welterweight. Uh, he's going to look to bounce back from that. Bounce back uh, from a string of fights where he's something like two and six uh, in his last eight since challenging Israel Adesanya for the middleweight title five years ago. Uh, he's going to have to get past Rodriguez to get back on track. 37-year-old Californian is 17 and four, Overall, he is seven and three since joining the UFC as a veteran of season three of Dana White's contender series. I say veteran because he won, but was not immediately signed. But since he was signed, has had pretty good success, though he is on the first losing streak of his UFC run as he has dropped back to back fights to Neil Magny and Ian Gary. Uh, the most recent of those was just a little over a year ago at UFC on ABC Rosenstrike versus Almeida, where Gary tapped him out in the first round. Uh, neither of these gentlemen has a whole lot of momentum going for him, but Gastelum is nonetheless a strong favorite. He's minus 250, Rodriguez plus 200 on the comeback. Uh, Keith, Kelvin Gastelum is like five years younger than Daniel Rodriguez. I, That's crazy. How, how is Gastelum not 40 yeah. years old? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like it feels like he's been in the UFC for 15 years. I mean, he has been in the UFC for uh, over 10 now. He was That's one crazy. of the youngest. Fight it was like 21 in the tough yeah. house. He was one of the youngest fighters in the UFC when he arrived. He literally has kind of grown up under the lights. We've seen his mistakes and his triumphs over the years. There have been more failures than triumphs in recent years, but you know, uh, he, he still seems to be competitive most of the time out there. Does he have anything left? For either of these divisions, does he get past Rodriguez on Saturday? Like, tell me how you feel about this fight. When I think of Gaslam, I always think of, like, when he was on the Tough House and Ronda Rousey came in for, like, a – yeah, she wasn't the, the coach, but, like, the coach's, like, guest. And it was like, oh, look at cute little young Gaslam. The little kid has a crush on Ronda Rousey, you know. Uh, but, you know, 10 years later, he's still in the UFC. And uh, Kevin Gaslam. I feel like we we know what we got with him now. I mean, you mentioned it. He's he's only thirty two, but it, I mean, it it really it feels like this is his last stand. I mean, he's he's lost six out of his last eight fights. I I think being at welterweight is better for him than middleweight, even though middleweight is a weaker division overall. You know, it's it's very rare for us in general to argue for guys to move down, but he is undersized. I, I think I think the battles have taken its toll on him a lot. Add in a slew of injuries, add in the like countless stories of him slacking off and lacking motivation, coming and missing weight. I, I feel like this is the last stand, but I'd rather have his last stand be at welterweight, where he's at least you know not the guys aren't towering over him. 
Now he's a southpaw that he's he's more athletic than he looks. He moves fairly well. Uh, you know, I I think he probably still has fast hands. Uh, he he fights in bursts. He stands on the outside, then he kind of bursts in, sets up his shots well with feints. His output, yeah, his output was really low against Darren Till. That was a long while time ago, but we haven't seen him fight that much, so it's tough. His output against Sean Brady it was a which a major mystery because. I mean, the guy didn't have a chance to throw punches. He was on his back the entire fight. He, he, you know, his his best blow is that overhand left, though he can overextend at times. When he steps into the pocket and, and unloads, he has he has big power. I mean, I was thinking about when he like planted Chris Wyman. I mean, he didn't finish him, but he like he drops Chris's Wyman. But I will say, I think his power is a little overrated. Uh, I, I don't think he's the power puncher that the, the commentary team is going to try to make him sound like. They're going to make him sound like if he does touches your chin, you're, you're going out. Uh, he's He's got that wide base. So Darren Till had a lot of success kicking out his legs. He's above average wrestler. As he's gotten older, he's used it less and less. And his defensive wrestling is, is becoming an issue now, which was always like a strength of his. I mean, he couldn't go off the bottom against Sean Brady. Like the whole – I mean, Sean Brady's obviously yeah. a really good prospect. Good. No, go go ahead. I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't oh, yeah. Something. Uh, Sean Brady is a you know really good prospect. If, if he was backpack, <laughs> you know, we were making jokes on the recap show that he was still on his back. He's he's got a, a solid chin. Like that was the thing about it. The dude, you know, he's faced these who's who both at welterweight and middleweight, and, and and really never been knocked out. But he was briefly dropped by Sean Brady in his last fight. So if that's failing him, that's a huge issue. You know, if, if it's going to start getting worse, worse. Rodriguez is a big welterweight. Like even though Gaslam is down at welterweight, and I know this isn't his first fight back in the welterweight, but I'm saying he's not gonna be the bigger guy. Rodriguez is gonna be bigger than him. Rodriguez is southpaw, good output striker, good boxing. He's got quick hands. He's got a fantastic jab. I mean, his entire game is centered around that jab. It's very like Sean Strickland like his whole game is that. He has no problem winning a fight with just sticking out a jab. It, it was pretty much the only weapon against Li Jing Liang. That said, his his straight left is pretty clean too. He he likes his chef left cook. Tim Means and, and Preston Parsons got busted up by it. Uh, he has nice power. He's got a good chin himself. He can ease shot to keep moving forward. He's a better grappler than he gets credit for. While while wrestling really isn't his go to, he will sneak in one and every once in a while. Uh, he his takedown defense it, to me. I'm not sure about because he's shown really strong takedown defense in the past, but then he struggled against takedowns against Neil Magny. He has three subs on his record. He did catch Tim Means at a submission, which is which is I think is pretty impressive. But he slowed down bad against Neil Magny, and he felt like he mentally broke against Neil Magny. Like he, Daniel Rodriguez, he seemed like a guy that was on the rise, and then every once in a while, he, like not, not every once in a while, but he like he hits that next step up, and and he really struggles. And it's is the question is is Kelvin Gaslam still at that that tier up? I don't think it is, man. I, I think this is a passing of the torch moment. I, I'm I'm shocked by these betting lines. If you told me one was one was a, uh, you know, over two to one favorite, I would have guessed. Yeah, you know, unless I heard you wrong, I would have guessed Rodriguez was the favorite. Nope, you heard right. Gastelum is minus three fifty. I'm really really surprised by that. I think yeah, again. Rodriguez has had like leading along. He didn't look great. Neil Magny, he really struggled in. But that other performance, he, you know, he's he's looked incredible, uh, and, and looked like a guy that really, you know, was turning the corner. Like I think about, um, I mean, uh, Preston Parsons fight. Uh, I mean, he destroyed uh, Mike Perry. That was a long time ago, but. Um, I feel like even like Lee Jiang, like I thought he lost that fight, but it was a close split decision. Like Lee Jiang is probably better than Kelvin Gaslam at this point. Mm-hmm. I think Rodriguez picks Gaslam apart from range. I think Gaslam struggles to get inside, and he, he you know he eats a lot of shot. I think Gaslam is done. Give me give me Rodriguez by decision. Spoiler: It's unanimous. Uh, I think Gaslam is an old thirty-two, and. Rodriguez is probably a, a a young 37. I mean, Rodriguez was older than Gastelum is now when he arrived in the UFC. He was a little bit of a late bloomer. Like Rodriguez yeah, yeah. was – and the thing is, Rodriguez was a good but not great guy in California for a couple of years. Like, I wasn't surprised when he landed in the UFC. He seemed like a guy that was, was due. But I was surprised by the amount of success he had, especially uh, early on. 
I think you're right in that Neil Magny seemed to break him. But you know what? Even as late as 2022, that was something that Neil Magny still did to some pretty damn good fighters. I mean, you know, just ask Hector Lombard, ask a lot of people. Uh, he, he didn't quite break, but his first loss in the UFC, Nicholas Dalby did the Dalby thing to him, where Rodriguez won the first round. Dalby just won by kind of not going away. Uh, Gastelum, like there, there have always been, there's always been the unknowns about Gastelum. You never knew what you were going to get from one fight to the next in terms of like his output, uh, his preparation and conditioning, but there were certain standbys. Like he had one of the best chins in the sport where, I mean, he was, I mean, he just the people that he was beating, especially early on, like getting past maybe not the best fighters, but the hardest hitters in those divisions, like Uriah Hall, Jake Ellenberger, Nate Marquardt, Johnny Hendricks. Like those are guys that even if, if some of them were not at their absolute best at the time he took them on, all guys who hit like trucks and most of them hit Gaslam cleanly. And he was a guy that just never even seemed to be rocked. Like his, so his chin was always just a given, like a thing that, that he could hang his game on. And then the other thing was that, his, I mean, he's a good wrestler, even if that's gone away, but just incredibly game and strong and resourceful on the ground. I mean, we are talking about a guy that un until late in the fight was doing fine against uh, Chris Weidman, who was way bigger than him. Uh, he's a guy that beat Jacare. And in, eight, and in 2018, Jacare was still a serious problem on the ground and spent probably eight minutes of the 15 minute fight on the ground, just fearlessly dealing with maybe the greatest grappler in MMA history. As, as late as a couple of years ago, when we were already previewing these fights, like Ian Heinish wasn't a great middleweight, but he was a big dude and a good wrestler. Yep. And Kelvin Gaslam belly to back suplexed him, threw him all over the place, just kind of fearlessly ragdolled a guy that looked, well, a full weight class bigger than him. Cause he basically was, all that stuff has gone by. He the was way. very competitive against Cannon Air. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's a couple of years ago, but it's not that many fights ago because no. Gastelum was out for all of 2022. But the Brady fight was concerning for a couple of reasons. Brady hurt him on the feet. Like basically nobody ever has. We're talking about Gastelum who, you know, a few years ago gave Israel Adesanya a tougher fight than anyone had up to that point you know, uh, and Brady hurt him bad on the feet. And that's not Brady's forte. Uh, yeah, Brady dominated him on the ground. And that used to be the kind of opponent that Gaslam would have just been poisoned for. But no, Brady actually got back on track against Gaslam uh, after not being able to do that stuff against, you know, people like Bilal Muhammad. So even though both these guys are coming into this fight off of like dispiriting losses, I feel worse about Gastelum's because Ian Gary is not, or, or Kelvin Gastelum is not capable of doing to Rodriguez what Ian Gary did to him, or even what Neil Magny did to him. Like that's that's just not what Gastelum does anymore. I I can't believe the line is as wide as it is. I'm I'm with you here, uh, and I'm while I think both these guys are on their way down and out, I think Rodriguez has more left than Gastelum does. And specifically, he has it in ways that are going to be problems for Gastelum. Like, if Rodriguez establishes early that, you know, he has the better footwork, good lateral footwork, and just sticks his jab out there and starts snapping Gastelum's head back, I can see Gastelum kind of settling for that fight at this point. There was a time where Gastelum would not have conceded that just because the guy had longer range and a good jab. You know, he would have, like, power punched his way into range, dragged him to the ground, you know, or just powered his way into range and clocked him a couple times and made him taste some of that power. But no, like, give me Rodriguez to win a decision here. I'm I'm 100% with you, and it looks like a pretty big uh, upset, but it's one that doesn't feel like it to me, and I don't think it's going to feel like an upset when it's happening on Saturday. I think it's just going to look like a somewhat shot fighter kind of dealing with a very shot fighter. So it's unanimous. We have our unanimous upset pick for the card, and it's a pretty big one as Rodriguez is a two-to-one underdog here but I have Rodriguez by decision as well.
that brings us to the co-main event, or at least we assume it's still the co-main event of UFC on ABC6, an all-Russian heavyweight slugfest between Sergei Pavlovich and Alexander Volkov. Pavlovich, the 32-year-old, is 18-2 and two overall. He is 6-2 and two in the UFC, uh, a run that saw him challenge for the interim title in his last appearance. Uh, he dropped his UFC debut to Alistair Overeem, rack, uh, racked up six straight wins, including wins over top 10 standbys, Derek Lewis, Tai Tuivasa, and Curtis Blades, before facing Tom Aspinall, at uh, UFC 295 last November for the then vacant, uh, or not vacant, but for the interim uh, title. Aspinall knocked him out in like a minute and nine seconds. This is his first fight since that setback. He needs to get past Volkov if he wants to remain in the title picture. Volkov, 35-year-old Russian, 37-10 and 10 overall. 11-4 uh, and four since joining the UFC as a former M1 and former Bellator heavyweight champ. He is on a three-fight win streak since his own first-round loss to Aspinall two years ago. He has knockout wins over Jairzinho Rosenstrike and Alexander Romanov. And in his most recent appearance at UFC 293 last September, a second-round submission of Tai Tuivasa. So he'll look to make it four in a row. He is very vocal about not being anybody's gatekeeper and still keeping his own hope of fighting for a UFC title alive, getting past Pavlovich would go a long way towards securing him that opportunity. He is not favored to get it done. Pavlovich is minus 220, Volkov plus 180 uh, on the comeback. I will spoil any suspense and say that I am picking Pavlovich to win this fight, but I, I, I feel like I praise... Alexander Volkov to the rafters every time we preview one of his fights, whether I'm picking him to win or lose. And that is because he has done something that almost no heavyweight does. And especially almost no heavyweight who already had like 40 career fights and had titles in two major organizations before getting to the UFC ever does. And that's improve. Alexander Volkov <laughs> has improved. It sounds funny to say that. And if it sounds like I'm throwing shade on a whole division by praising Volkov for doing something that sounds basic, I am throwing shade on the whole division. Like heavyweight sucks. Uh, most heavyweights, like most heavyweights are not very good. And a lot of the greatest heavyweights are only good at one or two things. Like that, that's just how it is. And very few of them improve that once they hit like a top 15 level. Volkov has improved. When he got to the UFC, he was already a dangerous striker. I mean, he's listed at six foot seven, but he fights taller. He looks taller and he fights taller in the cage, but he wasn't terribly fast. He wasn't very physically strong. He was kind of flat footed. And so he was susceptible both to faster, aggressive strikers who could just get inside his huge range. And he was very susceptible to wrestlers. He could be taken down. He could be kept down and people could do work against him down there. Like he was good at, surviving like he's good at wrapping people up in his guard controlling their posture with his long arms but they would just kind of camp out on top chip away beat him up and he'd lose fights that's changed he's put on 20 or 30 pounds of muscle he's gone from a guy that walked around at a sort of soft 245 or 250 to a guy that looks like he probably cuts weight to get to 263 or 264 and he's turned that into just the physical strength to get under hooks and shuck people off him and he's gotten better at just keeping people away. Like presumably he's slowed down physically between age 27 and age 35, but he's gotten better at keeping faster fighters off him. He's embraced that front kick up the middle as kind of a secondary jab. And it's just, I mean, when he does it, he looks like semi shilt where it not only stops the forward momentum, but I mean, speaking for myself, that would ruin my whole week. One kick to the bread basket from Alexander Volkov up the middle. And I, I'm calling into work for the next week. <laughs> I'm probably shitting, my, probably shitting my pants. Yeah. I mean, he is, he is seriously, uh, he's beaten people with that. Like, like people who wanted to wrestle him have tasted two of those and have given up on trying to wrestle him. Marcin Tybura didn't want any more of him after that, uh, any more of trying to get him to the ground after that. Uh, Alexander Romanov, like one body shot. And like, we've, learn that about Romanov, but like Volkov gave him no chance. Uh, so yeah, he, he's markedly improved. He's beating people now that he might not have beaten five years ago. And 
in Pavlovich, he's fighting a guy that's going to be shorter than him, going to have a shorter reach, and is going to want to box him and will need to get inside in order to do so. In spite of all of Volkov's improvements, I just don't think he's going to be able to stop Pavlovich from doing that. Like, And that's more commentary on Pavlovich being special. Just, you know, he's uh, he's a huge guy himself. He's surprisingly nimble. He has fast hands. He has a ton of power in both hands. Ideally, he prefers to conduct his business on the feet. I mean, you look at his record, it, you know, he's got 15 knockouts in, in 18 wins. Uh, that belies that, I mean, he's actually pretty comfortable on the ground if it goes there. But, you know, his ideal fight, kind of like Volkov's, is a, a sprawl and brawl type thing. Just, I, I look at where Pavlovich has looked vulnerable. Like, he was having trouble, I mean... Yeah, just he got clocked by Tom Aspinall, but that's a combination of a couple of things. One, Aspinall is, is a special athlete himself. Like he and I know I just finished listening to Dominic Cruz last night say mirror match 18 times uh, in one night, but it was kind of a mirror match in two guys that were both big heavyweights who were just shockingly nimble and light on their feet. And Aspinall hit super hard as well. And Pavlovich probably had the takedown in mind, which left him open for the combination that tagged him. None of those are things that Volkov is going to do to him. I I do see Pavlovich getting past Volkov's defenses, finding his chin. And I I think it's probably going to be pretty quick. Like Pavlovich is, is a quick starter. Yeah, like a, as admirable as I find Volkov, And as much as I enjoy having him in the UFC, I don't think it's going to be his night on Saturday. I think Pavlovich is is going to uh, just, you know, faint, get past uh, the jab, get past the front kick, find Volkov's chin early. I think Pavlovich probably gets a a first round knockout here and reasserts himself as a guy that's going to might fight for a heavyweight title around the end of this year kind of depends on what John Jones does. Uh, yeah. Or doesn't do, but yeah. yeah. Pavlovich yeah, he, isn't going anywhere. Yeah. He, he might fight for the title, but he's definitely not going to be against John Jones. <laughs> he definitely will be against the current champion. That ain't happening. Yeah. Uh, that guy hits way too hard for John Jones. To take that fight. Um, uh, yeah. This is, this is a, a really, really fun fight for heavyweights. I mean, yeah, we talked off off the air. Like this could could have got bumped to the main event based on mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of two names versus one name, and I, and that wasn't mean to be a diss on Al Scarif, but it is what it is. Like he's never been ranked. He's yeah, you know, he's kind of the guy rising up with compared to you know two established heavyweights that you know one or two ways, uh, you know one or two wins away from getting a title shot. Sergey Pavlovich, that I love this freaking guy. I love watching this guy fight. You know, he's he's a very athletic heavyweight. That he he isn't technical. He's just he's so explosive. He's got quick hands. He's accurate. Works behind a power jab, straight shots down down the pipe. One of the hardest hitters in the history of the game. I mean, Pavlovich straight right is incredible. I said it last time. His left hook is like a <laughs> weapon of mass destruction. He does this like slip uppercut, which is so rare but effective for him. He works, you mentioned he works fast. He comes out the gate. He's got 15 first round knockouts. He, I'm sorry, 15 knockouts, six in the first round. Uh, sorry, fi- no, I'm sorry, I'm saying this wrong. 15 first round knockouts of his last six wins, they all came in the first round by knockout. Uh, I described him in the past as like a real life Ivan Drago. He's doesn't say much, plain look, but he's, he must break you. <laughs> you know, great chin. Uh, he got tagged up by. Tied to Avasa in their fight and didn't even flinch. Now, sure, he got blasted by Tom Asimov, so you could question his chin a little bit, but I think that has more to say about Asimov than it does about Pavlovich. I think Asimov is special. Uh, he, he, one thing I, I don't like about his striking, he's, he's mostly just a boxer. He almost never really kicks, uh, or, or it's not really a big part of his game, I should say. Doesn't check leg kicks. He hasn't wrestled much in the UFC. I mean, it's hard to wrestle when you're just knocking guys out. <laughs> left and right, you don't really need to. But he did show on in back in the day at Fight Night Global that he can wrestle. Though Al Sorbin showed, you know, if you put him on his back, he could struggle. Again, I think that says more about Overeem at that time than it did about Pavlovich. But he stopped takedown attempts from Curtis Blades when they fought, which was which is a 
you know, big, big, you know, plus sign, but he is a submission threat. Volkov, I mean, obviously you talked about being a heavyweight. He's, you talked about how like thick he's gotten over the years besides being, you know, almost seven feet tall. He, he's a good striker, very technical, works on a crisp jab, keeps his opponents at bay with his long straight shots. Uh, doesn't give enough credit for how accurate he is. Good teep kicks. Uh, he does need to check the leg kicks. Uh, I go back to like two of us where he was having success battering his legs. If you get inside of him, he uses movement really well to kind of keep you out of range. Uh, you know, he just touches only on those power shots when he has an opening. Doesn't get enough credit for his power shots. Like the tall guys never did. They, they never, they always talk about long jabs or long kicks. They don't talk about the power. Volkov's got power. Uh, he's got a solid chin. I mean, really in his UFC career, only that, that, come from behind win against Derek Lewis and some may even really hurt him bad. Uh, the the ground game has been an issue. I mean, go back to like the Curtis Blades fight where he was taken out 14 times in five rounds and, and then he got smoked on the ground by Tom Asimo, but he showed some slick offensive grappling himself against Tuvasa. I think this is a crazy fight. I, I, I truly believe both guys have the ability to become heavyweight champions. That's how high I'm on them. Like, I'm, not, I'm not picking that. But I, I, it's not out of the realm of possibility if you told me a year and a half ago that either one of these guys is heavyweight champion. That said, I'm going with a power privilege too. Like we're in agreement on this one, and I, I'm, I'm a, we're totally in agreement. I think it's going to happen early too because not a knock on Volkov is just a high praise of Pavlovich. I say he lands one of these big, big early shots, and, and he keeps his first round knockout streak going. Give me Pavlovich my first round knockout. With that, we come to the main event of UFC on ABC6, a five-round fight in the middleweight division between former champ Robert Whitaker and rising prospect, I guess now rising contender, Ikram Alaskarov. Whitaker, the 33-year-old New Zealander by way of Australia, is 25-7 and seven overall. He is 16-5 and five since joining the UFC out of the tough smashes season. That's tough... Uh, Australia versus UK back in December of 2012. So just over uh, 11 years in the UFC. He's 16 and five in the UFC. He's 13 and three at middleweight. Uh, he obviously is the former champ and his three losses at middleweight are two to uh, divisional goat contender Israel Adesanya and one uh, to your current champ, Drickus Duplessis. His knockout loss to Duplessis uh, a little under a year ago, uh, was at UFC 290. He bounced back from that in February with a unanimous decision win over Paulo Costa. He had been scheduled to take on Hamzat Shamayev, the man that nobody seems to want to fight in the headliner here of UFC Saudi Arabia. Shamayev withdrew with an injury. On short notice, in steps Ikram Alaskarov, who had been scheduled to take on Antonio Trocoli last weekend at UFC on ESPN 58. Alaskarov lobbied for and received the bump up in both card position and card relevance. And he has the biggest opportunity of his young career here. 31 year old Dagestani is 15 and 1 overall. He is 2 and 0 since joining the UFC out of season six of Dana White's contender series, and he is on a seven fight win streak overall. His UFC wins are both first round knockouts. Uh, he completely flatlined Phil Hawes in his debut a little over a year ago, then came back in October at UFC 294 and hit Warley Alves with a flying knee in uh, two minutes of the first round. So he looking to stretch that to three, immediately insert himself as a outside title contender at 185 pounds. I'll quiz you on this one. Keith, your favorite is minus 140. Your underdog plus 110. Who are they? Whitaker is the favorite. You are correct. Robert Whitaker is the favorite. Uh, part of me was mildly surprised. Uh, like, I, <laughs> surprised he's like, the favorite or not, the, not big yeah, enough? Just, like, part of, no, no, like, part of me thought that, like, weird money might have just gone in and pushed the line towards Alice Garov when the fight was announced, but no, Whitaker is no. the favorite and okay. I'm without tipping my hand on who I'm picking. Uh, I, I think it's sensible that he should be the favorite. He's the, the far more sure. proven fighter. Uh, tell me how you feel about this fight and who you think wins. Yeah. Without giving away my pick, I would just like, I don't look at the better lines. I, I figured Whitaker, you know, former champion, 
you know, top five guy or what, you know, wherever he is ranked, you know, top three or something like that. I, I thought he, he'd be like a negative 200 versus a guy, you know, unranked guy taking the fight out of short notice. Now I know he was fighting, you know, last, you know, last night. So it's a little, little different. You know, he was, he was not like he's coming off completely uh, without any training camp, but you know, not training for Whitaker and, and vice versa. I know they go both ways, but I mean, Whitaker, Whitaker was a massive underdog to Shemaev. Really? Yeah. Whitaker was like, like Shemaev was like minus 250. Wow. Yeah, I don't know jack shit about betting lines, huh? <laughs> I thought it was going to be a pickup based on, you know, like Usman, you know, Shumayev gassing late and, you know, adding the the, the five rounds instead of three. Yeah, like Whitaker started as the favorite and the line moved like all the way over to uh, wow. Shumayev's side by the time wow. it was canceled. Yeah. Wow. Like I said, I, these, I don't know anything about betting, I guess. Uh, or at least not, you know, how the lines go. Whitaker, I mean, this guy's he's a well rounded fighter. Like I felt like he broke this guy down a lot and, and they, I'm always finding new things about this guy. He's a he's a really good striker. I always say he, he's he's more of a technical striker than a power puncher. His his whole game is centered around his, his jab. He's one of the few guys that'll double it up. He he sets up all his offense off that jab. He also defends attacks by holding his ground with the jab. He he kinda does the same thing with overhand right. He'll he'll wing this overhand right to land, or also just wing it to kind of keep his opponents from coming into that the range he wants. Uh, he he's he's he tries timing his opponent's attack. And he's pretty good at doing it. I mean, he picked up the time of Canonier of Vittori really well. You know, beating them to the points of contact. It, it took him a little while longer than usual against Paul Costa, but about midway through the fight, he said he really picked up Costa's. Um, timing and just beat him to the point of contact he doesn't really good at changing up his own rhythm so it's so timing him can be tough uh, he disguises his attacks well as like like he likes to fake the body and then throw a jab like he'll kind of like pump fake the body then pull it up to the jab or another thing he likes to do is like kind of like do a little short fake with the jab to kind of get you you know the opponent to pillar and then he'll and then he'll bring that same jab into a hook around the defense just little things like that he's very clever at He's he's sound defensively. He's a good slip and rip guy. Good head movement. He, you know the way he slides out of range and then lands on that legendary left hook is is one of his best. He's good at misdirecting. I was, yeah, I was talking about that high kick of his where he darts one way like a dart to the left and throw a high kick over the top. It's one of my favorite techniques that he does. He'll throw like mean oh, John Jones oblique kicks if he has to. He's got. Good calf kicks. Uh, we saw that against Costa was beating up the little calves. He generates power by being heavy on his front foot, kind of like a boxer. But it does leave him vulnerable to leg kicks. And what happened in his first fight against Romero? I mean, that's going way back, but still, uh, he does lose some power because he'll he'll lunge or overreach at times. Uh, if the fight is in close quarters, I didn't think he's really good at that man. Even though he's he's an undersized middleweight, he's he's mean in the clinch, looking for elbows inside. One of his best, you know, biggest weaknesses in the past. I've, I've pointed this out about Whitaker a lot. Is his, is, like, desire to even the score if he gets hit hard, and he'll kind of chase, uh, you know, chase a big shot back, and, and that led him to get knocked out against Izzy in the first fight. But against Costa, Costa came out strong on him. He didn't do that against Costa. He didn't chase an arc. He just kind of took what came to him and and was able to really rally and look good. Uh, he is a wrestler and. He's been doing a lot lately, which I like. You know, he's got a lot of takedowns. Uh, you know, his takedown defense was super, really good against Romero back in the day uh, with no ACL. But he did give him a takedown to Drake Duplessis. But I think, man, Duplessis, <laughs> it's kind of weird to call the champion underrated and <laughs> underrespected, but it's true. Like the guy, he's always been counted out. Uh, and he's so much better than that I've given credit for and so many other people. Uh, if Whitaker's on top, good control, good ground and pound. Now we'll go to Al Scarif. Like obviously my notes on Al Scarif is not gonna be as long as Whitaker's. You know, Whitaker's been in so many championship fights and, and digging deep on him. What I've seen is Al Scarif and and everything I'm gonna say is what I just said a week ago. Like I'm like, nothing changed in my notes. <laughs> the dude's a killer. Yeah, he gets the you know, he's a great boxer who and what I mean by that, because you know, we just previewed Al Scarif against yeah. Uh, Tricali. So if people didn't watch that one, we, so like my notes haven't changed in a week because you know when we taped that we didn't know yeah. the, the bout changed. 
uh, yeah, he's a good boxer. He gets in the pocket and he throws down hard, short, tight hooks. Got a nice, powerful jab. Uh, mean, tight hooks. Got seriously, serious power. I mean, we talked about him starching Phil Hawes. The biggest issue with him is his lack of head movement. He doesn't move his head enough. Uh, I like his kicking name. Good teep kicks um, up the middle. He'll throw some uh, flying knee, but he doesn't check leg kicks, uh, which could be a huge issue against a guy like Whitaker. Uh, what I've uh, my favorite thing about him is he has a killer stick, though. He hurts you. He puts you out. Uh, he's a good wrestler. Nice reactionary double, smother and top control. He has a submission threat. He he likes Kamara's. If you take him down, he's really hard to hold down. And I, like I go back to like his fight against Shemayev, he was stuffing takedowns who, against Shemayev, which is super impressive. This this is such a good fight. Like this, I mean, I I thought the Shemayev fight was 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 great too. I was, I was super excited for that fight. Um, this is probably your best consolation prize you can get. I like both guys so much, and, and I just think like we talked about this in the <laughs> you know in the beginning of the show. Just imagine you ask for a second. He goes from fighting in Antonio Tricali to Robert Whitaker in a week. Like, like holy shit. Is there, has there ever been a bigger jump in the sport in like one week difference than going from Tricali to Robert Whitaker? Uh, no. And, well, aside from somebody maybe that had something scheduled like in some regional promotion and got called up on short notice up. to fight like a top 10 fighter in the UFC. Other than that, yeah. I can't think of it because Tricoli – was one of the worst guys in that division. And Alaskar was a massive favorite against him to hear he's going up against Whitaker, who might still be the third best middleweight in the world. Yeah. So I am concerned about his training camp. Like how, how like serious was he taking Tricali? Was he training as hard as he should be? You know, that that's the question mark. No, he's, I'm assuming he's in camp, but again, like, how are you going all out? Are you pushing that extra going against Tricali than going against Whitaker? I don't think we'd ever challenge Whitaker. Like I, I think he's always going to train hard no matter what. Yeah. Um, so I flip flopped on this one. I'll be honest. I never do this, Ben. I'm going more off gut feeling than I'm going off tape study. Whitaker looked good against Costa as the fight went on, but I'm really worried that all these wars will finally catch up to him and his durability will fail him. And I think it happens this weekend. I'm going to go with the upset. I'm going to say Alex Garrett blasts him. I think this is going to be the beginning of the downfall for Rod Whitaker. Give me Alex Garrett for a first round knockout. Wow. Uh, you are leaning hard on the upsets this week, but with good reasoning behind them all. Like whether whether all four of them play out or none of them play out, they like none of them feels like a, like a stretch. Even the ones that are like to, for pretty – big underdogs I and you're right in that the decline is going to come for Robert Whitaker at some point and when it comes it's probably going to come pretty quickly because he's been in some incredible wars over the years he is one of the greatest middleweights of all time but even in his absolute prime his magic was not about being unhittable like that that was never like he he went through some fire even in his best performances and he's had a major knee injury. Like he's looked remarkably good since then, but those take something out of you, especially someone who is both dependent on movements on the feet and, you know, like such a good wrestler. I, it, he's going to slip at some point. And when he does, it'll be quick. And if it's now, Alice Garrett is exactly the kind of guy who will make him pay for it and will make him pay quickly. Like he, again, he's got massive power. Uh, Whitaker is awesome. Like there's, there's something admirable about fighters who are big game hunters. Like it's one thing for some fighter who's fresh in the UFC wins their first two fights and calls out the champ. Like, of course, yeah. you, know, you shoot your shot. You, you got, you got the mic, like Felder's holding the mic in front of your face. You got 90 seconds. Of course, you're going to call out the biggest name you can. There's something else about being the guy on top, the guy with more to lose and calling out the people. Nobody wants to fight. Like Conor McGregor used to have that. Like for, for what a like doofus 
you know, he's been over the last few years. It's easy to remember that he used to be the guy that like, he was not afraid to fight Khabib. Like he had the self-belief that he, he was going to be able yeah. to, to do it. Uh, like Whitaker was supposed to fight Hamzat Shemaev on Saturday. And the thing that people might forget about it is that he lobbied for that fight. Whitaker, the guy that more than almost any <laughs> more than almost anybody else could have sat after the Costa fight, maybe waited for someone to get injured yeah. and saw if his phone would ring. It's like, no, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna call for a fight with the guy that nobody wants to fight. <laughs> Whitaker lobbied for a fight with Hans Shemaev. Like for that, he and Gilbert Burns will just always carry the gold star. And it's interesting because uh, you know, Whitaker's coach, Alex Prates, said, you know, we watched the Burns fight and we think the keys to beating Shamayev were there. Like it was close. It was competitive. We think Robert Whitaker could take that kind of basic game plan and use it to, to beat Shamayev. You know, he said he's been doing like 10 rounders wrestling in, in the gym, both like defensively and offensively getting ready. All that preparation suits him pretty similarly well to deal with uh, Alaskarov. Like, Alaskarov is not the same fighter as Shemaev, but there are a few things uh, in common. Like, obviously, uh, Alaskarov is a he's a monster hitter. He's a very good striker. He's a very good wrestler. He's not quite as huge and fast as Shemaev. Like, it, it's not quite at that same level. That makes me think that... And Alaskarov is, is more likely to keep leaning on the striking where Shemaev may well have come out and wrestled first or just always had that as the immediate ripcord to pull if he started getting stuff he didn't like from Whitaker on the feet. Like, you know, Shamayev is a wrestler first who has become a dazzling striker. Uh, I like this matchup for Whitaker. If he hasn't slipped physically, I think he can hang without Alaskarov on the feet. It's going to be a narrow margin of error. Uh, Alaskarov will make him pay for defensive lapses. Uh, if he doesn't keep the same kind of poise he had against Costa and try to, you know, like, as you pointed out, try to try to get it back immediately when he gets hit. Uh, Alaskarov can make him pay for that. I think Whitaker can take Alaskarov down. Like Alaskarov did, you know, he, for the two minutes the fight lasted, looked pretty good wrestling defensively against Shemaev, but Whitaker's takedown attempts, like when he turns to it, they're so well-timed. It just, it, it almost just feels like, another part of a of a of a combination like it makes me think of george st pierre where like whitaker and yeah I, I got the one two i got the two three i got the three two i got the the one two in the leg kick and i got the two three in the knee tap just the yeah. you know it's just it's just a part of a seamless whole uh dominic like, cruz to do that too yeah dominic cruz probably the king of it honestly the the guy who would disguise his takedown attempts in the middle of kind of his striking combinations. I think Whitaker's got this. I, I don't, Whitaker's a, a slight to moderate favorite. I think that's probably appropriate. There's a ton of danger in this fight for him, but give me Whitaker to just recapture the magic one more time, thread the needle. He can't afford to make any major mistakes against Ellis Garov, but I think he gets it done. I think he wins going away. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he has some scary moments early on. But Whitaker is somebody who makes pretty good adjustments between rounds, seems to figure out uh, his opponents. And, yeah, give me Whitaker to win and look more convincing along the way as he does so, kind of pulling away towards the end, leaving Alaskarov with plenty to take back to the drawing board. I have the feeling we'll hear from him again. Uh, he's not done as a top 10 or even top five fighter, but Saturday night is going to be Whitaker's night in my books. Give me Whitaker by decision. And that is it. The surprisingly brief Sherdog Radio Network preview for UFC on ABC 6, Whitaker versus Alaskarov, also known as UFC Saudi Arabia. We were trimmed all the way down to uh, 11 fights by the end of the night with the cancellation of Naimov versus Bagdasarian. If they find a replacement opponent for Naimov, I mean, you're on your own there, unless it's like Max Holloway or something. You know, Keith and I will maybe get on the phone in the middle of the week and say how we feel about it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we hope you enjoyed. We do our best to give you uh, as good a mix of in depth analysis and occasional humorous asides as you'll find anywhere in this business. Uh, where else are you going to find 
five minutes of Fedor Emelianenko conversation in the middle of uh, a Bantamweight undercard fight uh, breakdown. Please do like, subscribe, give us a follow, give us a thumbs up, give us a comment. It costs you nothing, and it helps us continue to bring you this content for free. Uh, Keith and I both man the comment sections, so if you think either of us are out of our gourds on any of these picks, including Keith's quartet of upset picks, let us know. Uh, if you're right, we will give you all of your flowers on the recap. The recap for which you should join us. We are live on the Sherdog YouTube page right after the main event. We will talk about all 11 of these fights, or maybe 12, uh, talking about what was good, what was bad, what was surprising, what was controversial. There's always something. Hopefully this time it's not in the main event. Uh, we'll talk about what is next for some of the notable winners as well as losers. And we will talk with you. The live chat on the YouTube page is open that whole time. So we're taking your questions, your comments, and your hot takes in real time. We have a growing community of friends that hang out with us after the fights. And we would love for you to be part of it. Between now and then, happy Father's Day. Enjoy the rest of your week. And by all means, enjoy these fights. To the sea. Tales. While you're hunting 